Welcome back, everybody. If you're looking at your clock, we'll see we've been gracious and we've allowed you another 10 minutes. We felt that was perhaps necessary given we crept in a little bit in the opening session. So hopefully you've all had enough time to perhaps visit the restrooms, grab yourself some refreshments. Um, as we get into our first uh, session, uh, really technical session, uh, so to say, and at this juncture we're looking at addressing food insecurity and malnutrition by leveraging nuclear science and technologies in the advancement of the relevant sustainable development goals. And here we really want to put a focus on those cutting-edge innovations in using nuclear and isotope techniques in agriculture and in food production. These technologies, as we know, will help enhance our crop improvement, our animal production, our disease uh, and pest management, our precision agriculture, bolstering resilience against climate change and improving food security and nutrition. So this is our first panel. You'll be hearing um, each of them have prepared a presentation for you and there will be an opportunity to engage them in questions and answers. That is not just the preserve of those of us who are in the room, but also to our virtual participants. We have a virtual moderator who will be collecting questions uh, from those participants who are joining us online. So please, ladies and gentlemen, allow me to just perhaps give a general welcome and introduction uh, to the panelists. Uh, we have Mr. Christoph Muller, Mr. Scott Chang, Mr. Lu Chang Lu, and Ms. Miriam Kinua on the panel. And I also have to add there, we've got Mr. Uh, Mrs. Farai Mucha Day, a uh, round of applause for each of them. So, as promised, they have prepared some presentations for us and we have given them uh, a very generous 10 minutes uh, to present uh, to you all and then we'll have a question and answer session. So, what I feel we should do is allow them all to do their presentations and then get into the questions and answers afterwards. So, what I want to encourage you to do is if, if a question comes to mind, perhaps jot it down, uh, save it for that Q&A session where we'll really um, have the opportunity to engage each and every single one of them. Our first presentation uh, this morning will come from Mr. Christoph Müller. He is a professor at the Justus Liebig University of Gießen in Germany. I don't want to spend too much time on the bio, so I think I'll leave it at that with the title. Uh, for those of you who have the pro program, you will see all of that. But Professor, it's over to you now. And let's have the clock come on. Okay, thank you very much for the invitation. Uh, dear Excellencies, dear ladies and gentlemen, um, the topic is on how we can effectively mitigate climate change. You will hear a lot about climate change. Um, it is actually very simple. I'll show you this first slide and you actually see our Earth. And this Earth is absolutely unique. And what you can actually notice, we have a little rim allowed around this Earth, which is what we call our atmosphere. And this atmosphere allows us to live the life as we do. And on top of it, we do not have a second Earth, even if we would find another Earth. It would be so far away that it would be no use for us. That means we are stuck with this one here, right? And on top of it, we have certain resources on this Earth. And we know that for more than 250 years that these resources can only sustain a certain number of people, a certain number of what we actually do on this earth. And I think that it's very important. All of you guys, all of you ladies and gentlemen who have a bank account back home, you know, if your bank account goes into debt, then you're in trouble and it's not sustainable. And that is exactly what we need to keep this earth on, that we need to keep it sustainable. What we know is that uh, from the World Meteorological Org Organization, last year was the warmest year on record. We almost reached a 1.5 degree target. Uh, we had 1.45 degree greenhouse gases. Not only carbon dioxide, but also methane and nitrous oxide have increased dramatically with all the socioeconomic problems. And we already heard this morning that undernourishment is a big issue. You know, it, we were actually going down, but uh, in the last five years, undernourishment is actually going up again. And we can see that easily in this um, global planetary boundary concept, where we put all the resources together, 
And if we overstep these resources, then we are in trouble. And you see here, there are nine boundary concepts. And you see that most of them, except of three, we have already exceeded. That means we need to urgently find a way to bring it back to sustainability, right? Now, when we actually talk about practical steps, we should probably have a look at one of those boundary concepts is nitrogen. Nitrogen, we already heard about this morning about nitrogen. Agriculture uses nitrogen to actually get yield. We need to close the yield gap in certain parts of the world, like in African states. Um, what you actually notice here, if we have the regional boundaries drawn up on the planet, there are, of course, red parts. You see that here, mainly in Asia. But we have a lot of areas where it's still green, like most of the countries in Africa. We can probably intensify. That means we need to have regional concepts to actually tackle this problem here. Um, now, what kind of contribution can make certain mitigation options here? Um, we actually have four different ways to actually mitigate climate change. Loss and waste. We urgently need to reduce loss and waste. Then, of course, technology. New technology can help us to mitigate climate change. Um, diet is a big issue. You know, we all know, certainly in Europe, um, that we are perhaps eating too much meat. 70% uh, of the freshwater resources are captured by animal production. We know that. That means if we actually change the diet to a more healthy diet, perhaps to a more food-based, plant-based diet, it will actually help. And of course, the socioeconomic issue needs to be solved as well. You know, um, how can we actually increase education and things like that? Right? And you see that here on this graph that uh, the certain areas um, can actually have a certain contribution. And we see here that diets, for instance, make a big contribution. For instance, ah, sorry. Uh, for instance, in greenhouse gas emissions, right? Cropland use or blue water use. Blue water use is all that water what we use from lakes, from, from rivers and so on for irrigation. And here we also have nitrogen application, phosphor applica uh, phosphorus application that are actually the main issues when we deal about losses to the environment, right? We uh, don't want to have eutrophication and all these associated problems that cause feedback effects, positive feedback effects that are harming the farmer later on again, because they cannot really crop as well as they did without these issues. OK, what kind of options do we have in agriculture? Um, cropping systems, for instance, are quite important. But also certain soil amendments are quite important. And management. OK, I'll run you quickly through, because we have only four and a half minutes left. Um, what we talk about this one here. And you see here, the yellow one is carbon sequestration. The red one is greenhouse gas reduction. That means with agroforestry, cover crops, legumes, row cropping, and so on, we can make a definite impact. And soil amendments, for instance, organic amendments are quite important, because we know if we actually keep the soil uh, amended with certain organics, that we can actually create water use efficiency more readily. I mean, water holding capacity of the soil will increase, and so on, and so on. Um, of course, certain fertilizer management, process inhibition, we are talking about BNI, is biological nitrification inhibition. We know sorghum, for instance, plants, they're very intelligent. You know, They can actually talk to that what's happening in the soil, and they can manipulate uh, microbes in the soil, in the rhizosphere. Uh, we take advantage of this one, for instance, by BNI, that are big programs at the moment ongoing, biochar. Or when we talk about management, uh, no or reduced tillage, erosion control, water management, all of these kind of things, I think most of us have heard about this one, right? Of course, most effective are those that are having combined effects. For instance, legumes in combination with fertilizer management. And we already heard this morning by Mr. Grossi that uh, he mentioned the cassava project, what the FAO IIA Center uh, has led, um, that there are huge positive impacts on this one if you actually start using 
different mitigation options together. And that's when nuclear techniques come in. Of course, best is if we take uh, from all three areas uh, management options, agroforestry together with no-till and organic amendments and things like that. I mean, you, we could go on, you know. There are a lot of good examples that the FIO IIA Center uh, has, has been supporting and has been doing in many countries in the world. And I'm pretty sure these brochures you actually see, uh, that gives you a good indication. Okay. Now, um, what is the IAA FIO doing? For instance, uh, in these kind of publicly available uh, open access books, uh, there are documentations of this one, what can be done. Don't want to go into detail here, but that is where nuclear techniques uh, and non-nuclear techniques are being described for everyone in the world so that they can use it. I think that shows the positive effect of the IAO IAA Center as well, right? Okay, uh, I want to end this talk by talking a little about climate psych psychology. Uh, and I would like to draw your attention on Daniel Kahneman. Who has ever heard about Daniel Kahneman? You know, he got the Nobel Prize in 2002 as a psychologist, the Nobel Prize in economy. And I think his theories uh, can be extremely effective to actually combat climate change as well, or to understand how we actually work in a certain way, how we do it. And I'll try to explain it to you. You might be surprised to see this picture. What do you see? You see an angry woman, you immediately have a reaction. Maybe this woman is very angry, maybe very soon this woman is going to shout or is going to be very loud. You get an immediate reaction to this one, right? That is what Daniel Kahneman calls system one, the intuitive system we have. Now, this is different to this one. Do the calculation. I'm pretty sure it's not intuitive that you actually calculate 17 times 24. These are examples from Kahneman. Uh, here, you need to sit down, you need to concentrate, you need to focus, you need to think, right, of what the solution might be. That means he comes up with two systems, two, system one, thinking fast, intuitive, and system two is thinking slow, conscious. Now, what we are actually planning to do, or what we're doing most of the time, which is quite interesting, is that we think that if we have certain convictions, if we have certain conscious decisions, we are going to base them on system two. We have thought about it, we actually know exactly what to do, right? Uh, and Kahneman shows, and that is probably where he got his Nobel Prize for as well, that this is all nonsense. This is simply nonsense. Uh, but here I can actually show that the system one gives us an incentive to system two, which is not checking what's coming from system one, and then we make a decision. He has a lot of examples, I don't have time enough to actually uh, draw on these examples now. Uh, but what does that mean for climate change mitigation, for our reaction? We need to have an intuitive reaction. How, for instance, do we address the value action gap? The value action gap is, we all talk about climate change. We all know climate change is very bad. Everything is going bad. Now, here in Austria, for instance, we actually notice that, right? Um, with all the flooding, that it seems to be, these extreme events seem to be increasing. Um, we need to have an intuitive response to this one to actually close this value action gap because the value action gap means we are thinking about this but we don't do anything. You know, that is actually quite normal. Everyone is concerned about it. Um, what do we need to do? And I think here comes in that we need to have a positive response and a positive outcome to it one. Point out the positive outcome to the people in your countries, to your farmers, to wherever needs to actually put mitigation measures into place. Uh, provide an economic incentive that they actually know they can actually make some money with it. Uh, it needs to be the next big thing. It needs to be positive. It needs to be perhaps sexy. It needs to be something that everyone wants. You know, only then our thinking will change. Perhaps we can learn from this tobacco industry. You know, the tobacco industry, they knew right from the 70s, I'm finished very soon, <laughs> um, that smoking causes cancer. They never homed in on this aspect, they homed in on things, acting together brings us close together, helps us to socialize, gives us a higher status, and so on and so on, and perhaps offers us all a long and healthy future, unlike smoking, right? Um, perhaps we need to learn from this one. What are the take-home messages? We have concepts available, and we do have concepts available 
already for the last 50 or 100 years. They're all there. We need to put them into action, right? We need to make sure that this is actually implemented and that we do not just talk about it. Even money will not help us, you know. Uh, like Mary Robinson said, Mary Robinson uh, was the former president of Ireland and the UN High Commissioner for Human Rights. She says, we have all the signs, we have all the statistics, that is all clear, crystal clear that climate change is happening. But our decision to actually change something is dependent on our heart. And uh, that is where we need to stress it. We need to have a positive impact, we need to include economic incentive, by implementing climate smart agriculture. And this is my last quote. That is from Paul Polman, former CEO of Unilever, and he basically said, there is no profit in a dead planet. And I think that is what we need to remember, that we actually need to take care of our planet, otherwise there will be also no economic incentive anymore. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you very much, Professor Miller. Um, I gave him grace because he went first. <laughs> there's, always, there's always a little bit graceful for the one who, who takes the initiative, but I guess, uh, no, uh, for the other speakers as well, I'll, I'll try and be accommodating as well in terms of how you're getting on with your presentations. Our next one we're going, is going to come from Mr. Scott Chang. He is Professor for Forest Soils and Nutrient Dynamics. This is at the Department of Renewable Resources at the University of Alberta in Edmonton, Canada. Well, thank you for the introduction. And I feel privileged to be uh, invited to give this presentation. So uh, Professor Christopher Mura talked about mitigation, options for mitigation to deal with climate change. Uh, in my presentation, I'm going to be more focusing on climate change adaptation. And how do we use nuclear techniques and related techniques to implement and accelerate climate change adaptation? So a set of uh, slides to, again, to emphasize that climate change is occurring and it's accelerating and it's having a devastating effect on our society. So this is the climate, this is the uh, global mean surface temperature normally. As we can see, that's keep going up. And this probably look fairly familiar to you, right? Last week, you had something like 300 millimeters of rainfall in a day. This happened in 2023 in China. They had rainfall that occurred in three days that almost equivalent to rainfall in that entire year. And so those are some of the climate change extremes. And unfortunately, in last summer, in the past summer this year, we had forest fire that burnt a historical uh, tourist town, Jasper. I'm not too sure how many of you have been to Jasper, but unfortunately one third of the town was burnt. And so those are all reflecting climate change that's occurring and again causing devastating damage to the society. The science has already been established that climate change is being caused by the increasing greenhouse gas concentrations in the atmosphere. And so we need to do something to deal with that. So we know the drivers, we know the impact, and Christopher has already talked about some of the mitigation measures that we can implement. There's no silver bullet to deal with climate change problem. Another way we have to deal with climate change is really to adapt to the reality, to the new reality that the climate is changing and we have to live with it. So how do we adapt to climate change? Um, there is potential to use nuclear and relay techniques to help to develop these adaptation uh, technologies or strategies so one of the potential applications of nuclear technology to, uh, make, uh, to adapt to climate change is to use nuclear techniques to develop varieties, crop varieties or species that are more uh, water use efficient, more resistant to drought. The basic principle here is that if the plants are experiencing drought or less water being available, they're going to be reducing their discrimination against the heavier carbon-13 uh, related to the carbon-12, which is more abundant in nature, right? So we can use that principle to detect uh, plant stress. And one 
really good example is done by scientists here at IAEA in collaboration with scientists in um, Austria and, and other countries. They were looking at using the C13 technique to screen and to assess the drought stress in banana plants, which is obviously a really important food crop. Um, so this technique will allow us to screen out uh, stresses that banana plants are experiencing. And so the farmers can then take measures to combat you know, uh, this drought stress. Another example is coming from France. They were able to use this carbon-13 discrimination. This is looking at the difference between the carbon-13 stable isotope composition in the leaves versus in, in the grain. Uh, looking at wheat primarily, but looking at uh, grapes, seeds, and other crops as well. What they find, even though it's quite technical, is that the difference in the C13 discrimination or the difference in the C13 composition between the leaves and the grains are really well connected to the, uh, the allocation of carbon from photosynthesis into grains. So if you have less discrimination between the leaves and the grains, there's more allocation of the photosynthesis into the grains. So that can be used as a technique to screen out crop species that are more productive under these drought conditions if more of the photosynthesis has been transferred into the production of grains, for example. Okay, so we're looking at the so-called the respiration use efficiency over the harvesting index, the HI. How much of the biomass being produced is going into the grains? If we have a lower IUE uh, or the respiration use efficiency to the harvesting index, there's more carbon being going into the grains. Okay, so the lower the ratio, the better. And so that's, again, another potential application of the nuclear techniques to screen out species or varieties that are more adapted to drought conditions uh, without, you know, end of drought conditions without potentially reducing the grain yield. Another potential application of nuclear techniques in developing adaptation strategies is to use the nitrogen isotope here, the nitrogen 15. Um, in nature, because of the nit different nitrogen transformation processes that are occurring in the ecosystem, in the soil in particular, it's going to leave behind N15 signatures in the different nitrogen pools. So we can use that technique to develop species that are more nitrogen use efficient, that can deal with um, more degraded soil conditions. So if we can develop species that are more adapted to these uh, more degraded soil conditions, perhaps as a result of climate change, then we can use that technique to, again, to develop species that are more adapted to uh, change environmental conditions. So in terms of adaptation to climate change, um, we have many different techniques available. We obviously have to assess the needs of each individual location, regions, or countries. Uh, depending on the conditions, we have to do the assessment. And then we have to develop techniques to adjust our agricultural management practices, for example, water management, or fertilizer management to try to improve adaptation techniques to deal with climate change. Again, as I mentioned earlier, we can develop, um, we can use nuclear techniques to develop uh, crop varieties to um, deal with climate change, to deal with uh, drought conditions in particular, to develop uh, species that are more drought resistant, heat resistant, or even uh, flooding resistant. And at the farm level, we need to emphasize the diversity of cropping systems, developing cropping systems that are more resistant or resilient. Um, just like Christopher was mentioning, agriculture systems will be one potential option to diversify um, farm operations at the farm level. And in addition to that, we have to develop policies 
to, um, to try to implement and to encourage different adaptation methods for these different farm levels. We need to practice um, climate smart agriculture uh, to try to adapt to climate change conditions. So we need to um, develop climate proofing of agricultural infrastructure, for example, as a way to reduce the vulnerability to climate change. Again, policy development is important, particularly for regions that are more vulnerable to climate change. We also need to adapt to ad address global food security issues. Um, another way to, um, I guess, I'm down to a minute, so just to conclude my presentation, um, we need to develop adaptation strategies as part of the action to fight climate change, in addition to mitigation measures, because again, we unfortunately, we still have no consensus globally whether there is a climate change occurring, right? But if climate change is actually occurring in different locations, we need to live with that new uh, reality. We need to adapt to that climate change. And again, we can use nuclear techniques to develop and accelerate adaptation measures to deal with climate change. So with that, um, that's in my presentation, and I guess I will take questions um, at the end of this session. Thank you, Professor Chang. Our next presentation is coming from uh, Professor Lu Chang Lu. Uh, he's also Executive Director General at the Institute of Crop Sciences. This is in the Chinese Academy of Agricultural Sciences in China. Thanks, uh, Mr. Chair, ladies and gentlemen. It's my uh, great pleasure here to give you uh, a talk to my uh, space breeding. So we are talking about uh, items of food to contribute to the food security under the climate change. Okay. And the G, uh, as the DG said this morning, so the most direct, most effective way, most economic way to contribute the food security to face the climate change is the nuclear application in crop improvement, new variety of development. Okay, and as the Dr. Chang's in the talk just addressing to the importance on the new varieties with the high use efficiency of water, high efficiency of nitrogen fertilizers, okay? So my talk title is the successful story of space mutagenesis in China. If you are interested in the theory of space mutagenesis, you can see the, the IEA, the new uh, approach in the table, the page 18, you know the detail of the space mutagenesis, okay? And uh, which one? The... Sorry? Agree? Sorry. Ah, <laughs> oh, the big one. Okay, the space induced mutation technique is the means we send our seed into space for the mutation induction. And then the mutated seed back to the ground, we screen the mutation to develop new varieties. Why use the space mutagenesis? Because in the space, we have a very special components. For example, cosmic radiation is different from the ground. And the witnesses, and a very important component we call high LET1, high linear energy, energy transfer. It's a nuclear concept, okay? It means we use no dosage can generate the big mutations. And we can also use the accelerate to simulate the cosmic rays on ground to induce the mutation. And what I can use, uh, show you, I wanna share you the success stories in the past more than 30 years in China. Actually, we started our space program in 1987. We use the passive boarding of our seeds into the original satellite, returnable satellite. And since 2006, we launched a special 
sentinel that we call the seed sentinel, 时间那么 age to actively board our seeds, 200 kilograms. And since 2022, we have the China Space Station. We board our seeds not only inside but also outside our station. Okay, so we have developed. And officially released more than 300 mutant varieties across the 15 different crop species. Okay, I would like to show you five first space mutant in the different crop species in different improved trees. First, the sweet pepper. It's the first space mutant variety in China, officially released in 1999. Okay, so it's very big fruit reed. You can see it's my hand. I think in two thousand five something like. Very good quality, high yield productivity. It's in the first space mutant in China. It's in the first semi、uh, sesame mutant variety, officially released two thousand seven, two thousand three. Okay, with the high resistance to calm blight. With the yield potential very significantly over the control, and this is a very high yield potential hybrid rice. Okay, we developed a very good restoring nine to generate a hybrid. We call the super rice. Okay, one sow two harvest. It means you just sow once, but you can harvest twi- two times. The maximum green yield twenty one more ten per hectare. Very productive. Okay, we know very well to face the response to climate change. The way is to increase the crop yield potential. Okay, yield potential improvement keeps always the highest priority for the responding to the climate change. Okay, we call food security. Okay, so this is very not not only for one hybrid. We have developed 14 different super hybrid rice, okay, with a very high yield potential improvement by space mutagenesis. And another sample is our group from the drought tolerant wheat, okay, Luyan 502. Okay, this is the first we call the first space mutant wheat varieties developed officially released in China for the national variety. And high water use utilization effectiveness. Okay, with the max yield of more than 12 ton per hectare. You can see in a road system, the Luyuan 502, is very、uh, non than the control. So this contribute to the high、uh, water utilization efficiency. Okay, and、uh, cultivated more than six million hectare. Across seven different provinces in China, more than 210 countries, counties,、uh, benefits. Okay,、uh, it's the second largest、uh, wheat varieties in China, 2018, and then when the national awards 2019. It's not only a good variety, but also a very good mutant gene plants. We can use this. Mutant gametes to cross with other more innate varieties to generate more and more new varieties. Here, show you the twenty more new varieties derived from five zero two have developed and officially released in China. And the last example to show you is the climate adapted wheat mutant, H M. H zero two. Why we call the climate adaptive wheat mutant variety? Because this variety is the high yield potential. Okay, the average yield is more than eight ton per hectare. Okay, and then in the in the in the regional、uh, trial production test. Okay, and with high、uh, resistance or tolerance. To drought, to salt, okay, and、uh, very good quality for Chinese noodle, okay. So it's a very very potential 
new variety, okay? Uh, this variety is uh, officially released in Hubei province in 2021. And this variety is now in a national regional mite location test for release. Okay? And this is a very, we, we call it uh, climate adapted wheat, okay? Because with a very, very good uh, integrated uh, stress tolerance. Okay? So it is a very uh, potential uh, promotion. Okay? And in the previous, we will use the mutation taken as a by specimen genesis to cover more and more crop species. Currently, we cover only 15 more crop species. But in the future, we will cover, we will build more than uh, 20 or 30 different crop species. Actually, we have a very good collaboration with the agency three years before, starting from a CRP on space mutagenesis. In the agency laboratories, they have bought the sorghum seeds and gotten some very interesting mutations okay, with the panic variations in their greenhouse. If you are interested, you have time, you can visit the agency laboratory to see the change, to see the variations of sorghum mutant. Okay? So, and we will also a pleasure with the uh, developing countries, especially the size countries, to collaborate in the space mutation. And at the end of this month, we will launch another special satellite, building more than 300 kilograms of plant seeds for the mutation induction. Okay? We expected more and more mutants, mutant materials, mutant gene plants generated through our interest in space program. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, Professor. Our next uh, presentation will come from another professor on the panel, uh, Ms. Miriam Kinua. She is Professor of Plant Breeding and Biotechnology. That's at the University of Eldoret in Kenya. Okay, um, I'm happy to be here today to present um, the impact of um, mutation breeding. I'm uh, an enthusiast and passionate about um, food security and impacting on food security in the world. We s it was seen in the morning that uh, science has hope. I mean, provides hope. But science is a tool. So it's up to us to be able to apply that tool. And I look forward to influence many of us because if enough of us personalize that people are sleeping hungry and that we do not just have figures, then we will be able to impact on food security globally. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, so um, my first slide is on um, what are the most pressing global um, challenges? We have poor agriculture. Um, the practices that farmers have are poor. We also have uh, rapid population growth and uh, crop failures due to diseases and pests. Climate change is a challenge. We've, we've already uh, seen that. And that affects the productivity. But we also have the problem of uh, low quality of food. I mean, the food supply is, uh, I mean, there is low quality. And also that uh, the poverty, if people are poor, then they will not be able to get uh, food. But uh, we have um, good hope because as much as uh, there are uh, problems like the, 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 the rust, I'm sure rust diseases everybody knows about, 
blight and bacterial um, wilt, and um, CMV for cassava. We have um, methods in mutation breeding and enhancing technologies that would be able to impact on this, and I'm just trying to show about um, the unlocking of the potential. Um, we have field selection with the farmers, and at the end, we came up with a, a potato variety that is bacterial wilt resistant, as well as um, uh, blight resistant. So mutation breeding is an answer, is one of the answers to the challenges that we're getting on food security. Um, in Kenya, we have um, at the University of Eldoret, we've developed uh, cassava varieties that are resistant to cassava uh, brown streak and cassava mosaic disease using mutation techniques. We have potato varieties, three of them, and uh, one of them, we called it Eldo Amani because of atoms for peace, because the, the project was um, using nuclear techniques and it was supported by IAEA, so we called it Amani because uh, out of uh, that, we were able to come up with those three varieties. We also have two wheat varieties, mutants as well, and uh, for those, we are having um, Eldo Mavuna and Eldo Baraka, high yields, resistant to stem rust, and uh, also very uh, good quality. For, for the potatoes, um, one of uh, the potatoes, that is Eldo BD, apart from it being resistant, we also found out that uh, the nutritional value has uh, improved where essential micronutrients uh, were enhanced through the use of um, um, mutation techniques. So. I've already talked about the, the successes, that we can use mutation techniques to reduce um, the breeding time. We can also uh, use mutation techniques to increase the yields and the quality, but there is a challenge. You find that adaptation rates, adoption rates of these varieties is low, not because the farmers do not want them, but we are slow in being able to produce the seed that needs to be, to be grown. The other uh, challenge is that many people are scared, I mean, not really scared, but they, they are not aware of what mutation techniques and enhancing technologies can do. And therefore, when they hear mutation techniques, like the way um, the director general was saying that this is not genetic engineering, but many uh, farmers and other consumers feel most probably it's genetic engineering. And therefore, the challenge is for us to be able to create um, the awareness that uh, this is a natural uh, method that is being enhanced, that is being um, induced so that we move uh, faster. The other challenge is the limited resources. We do not have enough resources to be able to uh, move as fast as we would wish to move. And that's where now uh, being together or networking and also uh, putting our um, efforts together, both those ones who have the resources and those ones who have the human um, capacity. So the way forward is that uh, we need to multiply uh, the seed so that we can be able to grow these crops on a wider scale. They are being grown all right, but they can be grown in a wider scale. Since the development was using uh, IAEA um, support, 
it means that these materials are available even for those ones who are outside Kenya. Um, I mean, it, it's this one of there was the understanding that if it is developed, then we can be able to make them available for others. Then we also need to utilize the mutation techniques and enhancing technologies further because we haven't reached the optimum. We can still improve the yield. We can also improve on other diseases. You can be able to use uh, the mutants which we've developed or you can do new um, uh, varieties so, so that you get um, better crops to take care of the new um, or the increasing population and also the new needs by um, the global populace on the different uh, food types. So how would I conclude? Uh, I would say that uh, Atoms for Food is a good initiative. We can be able to go far if we utilize the possibilities that are within that initiative. And um, technological advancements are there. Um, nuclear techniques can be used to be able to um, enhance uh, the performance. Then we also need global collaboration because if we work together, uh, then we will even achieve better will and um, synergize so that we can get better results. And that improved um, agricultural policies and global ones, not only national ones. We need to have uh, global policies that will be able to encourage the use of the Atoms for Food uh, initiative. And therefore, finally, I would wish to say that Atoms for Food is a viable way to address food and nutrition insecurity and so that we can be able to feed the world. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Kinua. And our final presentation, so I hope your questions are about ready now, uh, is going to come to us from Ms. Farai Muchade. Uh, she's the head of the Animal Production and Health Section at the Joint IAEA FAO Center. Uh, thank you uh, and welcome. So as indicated, I'm coming from the Joint FAOIA Center for Nuclear Techniques in Food and Agriculture. And what I'm going to take you through is technologies that we have developed and are developing nuclear and related biotechnologies for improved and sustainable animal production. Improved and sustainable animal production uh, to to really tackle the challenges that have been addressed or articulated in the first session of this day, challenges of food insecurity. We have heard about millions of people that are affected by hunger, millions that go food insecure, severe to moderate, but also seeing the demand for foods of animal origin. We have seen this livestock revolution, particularly in law, and middle-income countries emanating from population growth, uh, increased income, but also livelihoods of the communities. However, this demand for animal products is happening, and we know that livestock is really the prevalent in most of these low- and middle-income countries, but however, facing many challenges. Challenges of feed, the quality and the quantity of the feed itself, challenges of diseases, imaging and re-imaging and zoonotic diseases, and climate change, which is a long shadow for animal production in so many layers, because we know that through climate change, it changes the, the environment or the temperature conditions, and a number of animal breeds and species are not able to tolerate that. It also affects the feed resource base, so feed becomes uh, inadequate or it becomes of poor quality. It also results in pest and disease pathogens, and all these come and affect uh, animal productivity. However, we need to acknowledge also that livestock production has been uh, 
acknowledged or noted to contribute to, to climate change, and we need to address that, particularly when we are looking at improving or increasing the products of animal uh, production. So one of the, I'm going to go through about three uh, intervention strategies using nuclear and related technologies that we are working on is tapping into indigenous animal genetic resources, local breeds which are prevalent in almost all countries. And this is the advantage that they are adapted to local conditions. They produce optimally under uh, uh, prevailing conditions. However, noting that if we look at the FAO documents on biodiversity, we lose this biodiversity at an alarming rate. A number of animal breeds and populations are not even known and we are losing them. The global plan of action for animal genetic resources is really aimed at that to support the characterization, but also sustainable use of this animal uh, biodiversity. Uh, from where we stand, we have put together a combination of nuclear and genomic technologies to really assist in those uh, characterization and improvement of animal genetic resources. Uh, nuclear like radiation hybrid mapping and genomic like sequencing of livestock genomes. That really allows us to develop biomarkers that we can use to characterize and to select our populations. We have had success stories this year where we are celebrating the International Year of Camelids, we have developed genomic tools for camelids that can be used to uh, select and breed for it. And once you have these biomarkers, you can really use them for an array of applications, which can range from characterizing and implementing the global plan on animal genetic resources. You can use it also to improve your animal populations for traits of economic importance. For example, you can introgress certain genes and markers into populations. We have had success stories where we have integrated the twinning rate in sheep populations. Diseases as a factor that affect productivity, you can select for animals that can resist to certain diseases. And we have success stories for Imonchus contortus and other parasites. Uh, once you have your right genetics, then comes the challenge where you have uh, reproductive uh, challenges. You need to be able to disseminate. You have selected your animal populations, but are you sure that they are going to be propagated into the next generation? And a number of countries are really struggling with reproductive challenges from livestock point of view, longer calving intervals, animals that don't get pregnant at a schedule that's expected, and all these create a bottleneck. So you have improved your genetics, but you don't observe the impact or the outcome from it. And there we have a suite of nuclear technologies that we have we use, one of them which is radioimmunoassay technologies, which are very sensitive and specific. Uh, they use isotopes to be able to trace the reproductive cycle of animals. Uh, the equipment and the infrastructure is easy to set up in laboratories. And this with together with reproductive other reproductive technologies, for example, if you have artificial insemination or embryo transfer, then radioimmunoassay assay has really become of utility because you can use it to evaluate or to improve your artificial insemination services, to detect your animals and plan breeding programs, but you can also use it to minimize reproductive wastage. We had uh, case studies where animals that are pregnant are slaughtered because communities or farmers don't know that these technologies that are able to detect pregnancy at a fast rate would actually allow that to minimize those wastages and improve the reproductive performance of herds. Uh, the other challenge that's faced, you, you, you have your genetics, which is right in your population. You have reproductive performance, but you still need to make sure that the animals have adequate nutrition to be able to produce optimally. And animal nutrition is a big challenge, particularly when we are dealing with uh, issues of climate change. So there is either inadequate feed 
or the feed is of very poor supply. But on the other side, animal nutrition has also been the one major factor where livestock is uh, contributing to greenhouse gas emissions and therefore climate change. So nuclear technologies, isotopic technologies, where we trace nitrogen isotopes or carbon isotopes can really allow us to either characterize the feed resources that are there, are they of adequate nutritional value to the animals? Uh, would they actually help mitigate the issues of greenhouse gas emission and contribute or minimize climate change? But also we use those isotopes to actually be able to trace nutrient utilization to animals. Different breeds and different populations we have different capacities to utilize different feed resources. And having that knowledge would really assist farmers and communities to choose their feed resources, some of them that are local, and be able to use them optimally to, uh, to improve our food security. I think in summary, I would want to say uh, as the joint center, we have some of them are in development, some of them we have uh, already worked on, and we are disseminating them to member states, either through our coordinated research projects or our technical capacity uh, cooperation projects. And we disseminate this really in a full value chain approach to really address the full value chain of challenges that the communities face in livestock production. So being able to support member states to protect and improve livestock biodiversity to tap into their genetics of their animal local breeds and animal genetics, and then being able to optimize and address the challenges of animal nutrition, uh, come up with proper feeding strategies that farmers can benefit from at low cost, but also in a sustainable way, where it minimizes the issues of uh, greenhouse gas emissions and climate change. You need very good optimum reproductive performance in any head, and these technologies can be used to disseminate the superior genetics that we have, but also to make sure that we have minimized reproductive wastage in our populations. I'll end here, and thank you. And perhaps one more round of applause to all of our speakers for those presentations. We really appreciate that. As promised, we can now venture into some questions, um, and we're going to have questions taking questions from our virtual po virtual participants as well. But I want to begin in the room. If you can maybe show by indicating, uh, by raising your hand, if there are any questions at this point. Um, perhaps while you're still thinking, I can kick things off because I certainly have some questions for the panelists. But the way to do it is um, there is a device on your desk with the speaker. Just make sure that the red light is on and we'll be able to hear you. So I don't see any questions at the moment. And I guess I'll pick up over here. Professor Miller, as you were um, speaking, I was wondering about some of the efforts that we employ to mitigate uh, climate change, whether or not these are all global or they are more region specific, so to say. How should we approach mitigation efforts? Is there a, a one size fits all? Yes, uh, thank you very much. I think I already. Indi uh, indicated a little bit when I looked at the regional boundary concept of nitrogen, that for instance, for certain regions in the world, we can still implement certain measures or improve even agriculture or intensify it, whereas in others, we may have to reduce a little bit more. That means um, it's not a global um, sort of effort or a global solution, yeah. but it's a regional solution. And I think it's extremely important to note that because soils are different, clim climates are different, everything is different, and we need to find this local solutions. It, it's extremely important. Right. Thank you very much for that one. Any questions in the room? Don't let me have all, th okay, so let's do it this way. I have um, a hand in the front. I'm gonna take three at a time. So one over here. Yes, sir, that would be number two and number three. Thank you so very much. I do have a question, first of all, to Mr. Liu from China, and another one for, for Farai from the Joint FAOIE Center. So, uh, Mr. Liu, my question to you is that, uh, of course, we know very well China is mar very much in advanced in uh, space breeding. Uh, based on your presentation, we know that uh, China has already developed 
various of uh, uh, new varieties through uh, space breeding. So my question to you is that would you please just uh, uh, let us know a little bit about uh, the experience or how China has been working together or collaborating with together or helping other countries through South South or uh, cooperation or South South Triangular Cooperation. Thank you so very much. Thank you very much for that. I'll collect the other questions and then, yeah. and then we'll come back to the panel. So I do have yes, a question to Farai. Farai. That's right. Yes. So uh, Farai, uh, we know that this year marks the six years anniversary of the joint FU AE Center. Uh, of course, based on your presentation, we knew that what you presented, in fact, today is only a small part of the work of the joint FU AE Center. So uh, yeah. In fact, my question to you is that would you please, of course, due to, due to the time constraints, I don't think you gave us uh, good examples, the success stories. So would you please just give us one uh, success story in terms of uh, the work you presented to us? Thank you so very much. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you very much. Uh, my question is similar to the previous uh, speaker, and it is directed to Professor Liu. Mm -hmm. Uh, thank you very much for that very exciting work on the space work. I just wanted to know, uh, in particular, the, uh, the the work you have uh, 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 on the crops. Uh, what kind of medium did you use? Is it an artificial one, or did you take uh, soil medium from the earth to the space, or is it the uh, medium from there? I just want to know a little bit more. Uh, on that, or is it that it was developed here on the planet and taken to space? If you can please elaborate a bit. Got it. And the final question, yes, sir. Thank you for the presentation. I have uh, two questions. First is uh, for Professor uh, Scott Chang. It's about uh, we are talking about uh, you are talking about climate change adaptation, but. Climate change adaptation is not only talking about uh, drought stress and nitrogen efficiency, but also talking about the, concent the high concentration of carbon dioxide and also the, the, the increase in, in, in temperature. So whether these isotopes that you are using could uh, detect uh, such, such, such varieties to, to adapt in this situation, in this condition with uh, carbon dioxide increase and temperature increase. Uh, the second question is for uh, Professor Lu Xianglin. Uh, in your presentation, you mentioned that uh, there is a production of rice until 21.7 uh, tons. It's it's really very very high. Perhaps how much fertilizer and water you use to produce this 21.7 tons of rice? Thank you. Thank you very much. So we'll begin uh, with you, Professor. Yes, because I would the first question. I would the priority for the minimum. No, did I? I, I don't yeah, think. Your question, you have a question. Yeah. Okay. You have a question. Yeah. You have two. Yeah. 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 Do you remember your question? Yes, yeah, okay, I do. Good. Okay. Is it on? It Hello? Oh. Yes. Yes, so uh, thank you. Thank you, Dong Jin, for that. Yeah, I think we, we, we really have quite a number of uh, success stories mm -hmm. across all the, the three applications that, I, that I've that i talked about. If we look at uh, breeding and genetics and tapping into indigenous animal genetic resources, we have developed genomic tools. And this is very, very important because a lot of low and middle income countries don't have access to the genomic tools. And if you don't have the genomic tools, it becomes very difficult or it takes longer for you to improve the genetic potential of your populations. So one example that I gave is for, for the camelids. So we have developed a multi-species uh, camelid in collaboration with other institutes and other member states. And this is of utility. We are currently characterizing the camelid populations in, in, in Africa, in Kenya, in Somalia, and other countries, but also in, in Asia and all the other countries where we find the camelid populations. So this is really has made or allowed us to, or allowed the member states to be able to tap into the genomic tools that if we had not done that, they would not be available. Uh, in terms of um, 
uh, nutrient utilization. So we have done this across a number of member states using our coordinated research profile. And I think without mentioning the member states, I would say to date we have characterized over 200 local plant populations and we have found 20 of them from different member states that are of good utility to use to improve uh, uh, animal productivity because of the nutritional value, but that also have a potential to mitigate ag against climate change because of the lower uh, emission of the greenhouse gas gases that contribute to, to climate change. So there are quite a number of, 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 of of applications that we have you talked about now as we as we celebrate the 60 years of the of the joint center and one of the major programs for FAO which is very important is the global action plan for indigenous animal genetic resources we need to help we help each other we collaborate to make sure that we minimize the loss of the biodiversity of breeds and populations that are not known to exist or if they are known to exist, their genetic diversity is continuously deteriorating either to due to crossbreeding or to integration with, with exotic breeds. So every year we work with the different member states and we make sure that we target breeds that are not yet characterized, that are not known. Thank you. Thank you for that, Brian. Uh, you can pass the mic going that way. I do. Okay. Okay, thank you. Very uh, good questions. Uh, I started from the uh, direct and uh, fence uh, question. So China's space program started in the 30 years before. So we have an experience. Uh, we have developed uh, more than 300 mutant varieties of release in China. So this is a very important uh, issue first. And we can uh, uh, share technology uh, through different approaches. The first, the very important uh, the agencies platform, okay? We have uh, a collaborative uh, center, uh, IEA and uh, CES collaborative center in mutation breeding. And we started collaborating three years before from a CRP project on plant space mutagenesis, mm -hmm. okay? And uh, more than uh, 10 uh, member states joined this CRP project. We have two meetings already, okay? So this is the first approach. The second, uh, China have a uh, very strong uh, initiative we call the Belt uh, Road, okay? We have a very uh, open uh, policy to uh, collaborate with other countries, okay? Actually, we have uh, 20 more kilograms of seeds will be bought in our new satellite uh, will be uh, launched uh, end of this month, okay? So we will be uh, given opportunity for the mutation induction in the member states. And uh, another way is to the South-South uh, collaboration uh, for, the, for, the, for, the, uh, for the FAOI in the platform and through the South-South collaboration and for the, especially for the developed countries, okay? We, we, we can have the training courses, okay, for the young scientists. We can have a joint research program through the South-South collaboration. This is the diversity in the, uh, uh, and also we have just uh, established the M mutation breeding networks uh, across the Asia countries, okay? Extension to uh, Latin America, Europe. Just uh, happen to, uh, taken place a uh, uh, workshop on, uh, in July here for the 25 different member states. So we have diverse approach to share the technologies for the link. The second question for the media, for, the, for the how to build in our seed in the space, Usually, for very convenient, we just package our dry seeds in a blank, you know, in a, in a bag, okay? Uh, just to put in the inside of our satellite. And we usually, we, we, sometimes, we bought our tissue culture and uh, some uh, seedlings to the space, okay? And then to, for uh, one week or two weeks, even for one month's uh, flight in the space, and then to back to the ground for this mutation screen and following the, and the general uh, steder, uh, procedures on the mutation breeding, okay? And also for the uh, uh, super hybrid uh, rice, uh, this is just to show the genetic potential for our mutant variety, 21 times per hectare. This is just for the genetic potential. 
Of course, it needs much more fertilizers mm -hmm. and uh, waters. So we have another program we call the green super rice. We decrease half of the potential yield. For example, uh, 12 to 15 ton per hectare. Let's cut our mutant variety. We need uh, less fertilizers and less uh, waters. So we call it green super rice. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Yes. To Professor Chang. Um, yeah, that was uh, a really good question. I guess um, in 10 minute presentation, it's not possible to cover everything. But in terms of the um, increased carbon dioxide concentration, which fortunately so far, it hasn't really been considered as a stress. Um, the CO2 fertilization effect is known to increase productivity of crops. Uh, unless there are other limitations like limitations of water or nutrient limitations. But even in ecosystems where initially maybe there's no water or nutrient limitation, as a CO2 fertilization effect kicks in, um, sometimes these nutrient water limitations can come in after as well. So I guess my short answer to the question is yes, nuclear techniques are still applicable in developing strategies to um, adapt to these new conditions, uh, being uh, increased CO2 concentration in the atmosphere, particularly when the CO2, increased CO2 concentration is interacting with other stresses, like water stress or drought or uh, nutrient limitations where we can use nuclear techniques to screen uh, varieties that are more uh, adapted to these uh, future increased CO2 concentration con uh, uh, conditions. As to uh, heat stress, uh, which is another potential uh, condition that we have to deal with in the future, most likely heat stress is going to go together with drought. When you have high temperatures, etc. Uh, obviously, it's going to increase evapotranspiration from the soil surface, from leaf surfaces, and so forth. So most likely, heat stress is going to really go together with uh, drought stress. And again, um, selecting or breeding uh, crop varieties that are more adapted to deal with heat stress or drought stress is really going to go together. So again, I think... Uh, nuclear techniques are still going to be applicable in selecting genotypes that are going to be more adapted to with, uh, deal with heat stress in this case as well. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Professor Chang. We can do one more round of questions at least. Did I miss any hands on this side of the room? Okay, I see a hand over there. It's a bit dark. Okay, let's take that question. Thank you very much. My question to Mrs. Kinua. Thank you very much. Nice presentation. I would like to know uh, what are the key challenges in Africa in terms of seed security and how nuclear techniques, mutation breeding, and biotechnologies can accelerate, can help these challenges. Thank you. Professor, can you? I think you can go ahead and take that one. Okay, um, thank you, Fatima, for that question. Um, I feel that the greatest challenge that we have is not even the science, the basic. It is after, after applying the science, the product to get to the intended uh, consumers is a challenge. And uh, like you have asked about seed, um, you find that when you have the, the variety that you have uh, got, it has gone through the national system and it has been released. Now, uh, when it comes to multiplying the seed, the greatest challenge is having enough resource to be able to get out to the farmers, be able to show them that, look, we've come up with something good for you, and after you've sensitized them, 
to be able to multiply that seed either in the lab using uh, TC uh, methods, micropropagation, or in the field um, using um, the normal uh, field uh, propagation, but applying nuclear techniques to be able to uh, make sure that you have the right soil water uh, management, as well as uh, uh, checking on the diseases and uh, pests, and yeah, and, and uh, multiplication per se. So that is what I would say that I'm sure most of the African countries, it isn't the development of the variety that becomes a challenge. It is now multiplying that seed and being able to get it to the farmers and, and the consumers. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. Okay, I think that does it for our questions. Uh, just double checking. Oh, we have one more. Any, any other questions? Okay, this is the last topic. Oh, okay, all right, so two more. So we'll take these two, the gentleman and the lady. Hello, uh, me is Mr. Gelo Collins from Cameroon. I would like to know, I have heard about the using uh, nuclear techniques like uh, cellular in insect techniques on uh, uh, pest control. Mm -hmm. I would like to know, uh, like in Africa, there are many countries that use, uh, their economy is based on banana, or they use banana as a first uh, agri product for consumption in local areas. And we know that they will have uh, this fusarium that is coming to invade. Uh, it uh, looks like invasive in many countries, develop, developing countries. And you also have uh, root roots, diseases on uh, cassava. These are main crops consumed by, uh, in a rural area. Mm -hmm. I would like to know if there is any, how to apply the techniques to control the diseases. Because for the pests, it's possible to, if you don't have, uh, if you don't have a system, surveillance system that is developed, you, with the eyes, you can identify the pest, the danger. But for the disease, you find out when the destruction have happened. How the techniques, nuclear techniques can be used uh, to manage disease on those two crops. You also have a bunchy top on banana. Mm -hmm. And these are diseases that are trans, uh, transfer by, by soil. Uh, then it's very, I think that this is a, a sensitive to a pest. I would like to know how to use the nuclear techniques to manage those two, at least these two pests. Thank you. Thank you, sir. And the question from the front. Okay. Thank you so much. My name is uh, Dr. Huyam Saleh, director of AUI Bar. Um, my question is between um, two, uh, Professor Muller and, and Dr. Farah as well, um, regarding the climate change uh, mitigation, but I will bring here also the adaptation as well, because for Africa, Africa is contributing by 3.9% of the greenhouse gas emissions. And this 3.9% will include even the livestock contribution to these gases. And, and in Africa also we need to balance between the different needs of the populations that is, are growing um, to make sure that we are um, achieving um, for food security and avoiding malnutrition, considering that um, African citizens are behind the consumptions per capita for um, nutrients like meats and milk. So to have this balance in production, and here I'm not speaking only about intensification of production, but the sustainable production. So how we can do the balance between um, making adaptation and also uh, avoid that we are following the other regions in the world to make more issues for the greenhouse gas. So um, I, I need to know how the nuclear techniques can contribute to this, in particular for Africa. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I think let's take the ladies' questions first. And for I, you, the one, one of those was for you and for you as well, Professor Miller. Um, and to the gentleman, you've opened up something for us that we'll actually be unpacking 
in the second session that's coming up after the lunch break. But I saw, Professor Kenyu, that you were, you were nodding your head as he was speaking, so perhaps you want to say one or two things to that, if, if anything. But we will absolutely be getting more into that in the second se session um, after the lunch break. So I don't know if you would like to start, Professor Miller, and then I'll hand over to you. Yes. Shall I start? Yeah. Yes, please. Um, yeah, thank you very much. I think it's a very important question, what you have there. Because we do not really want to do the same mistakes as what has been done, let's say, after the Second World War, when we had the Green Revolution and all these kind of things, where we just applied technology, you know, fertilizer, whatever we wanted, uh, but ignored any environmental impact. And I think uh, you say, well, how can nuclear techniques can help us? Um, I mean, plants are very intelligent. I think I mentioned that okay. before, right? They know exactly what kind of nutrients they need. Mm -hmm. And with nuclear techniques, we can actually identify the processes that plants can manipulate. For instance, sorghum. Sorghum is a very important um, crop in Africa, I believe. Um, they can, for instance, inhibit certain microbial processes. And if we perhaps utilize them together with other crops, we might actually have a double benefit of things. And that is where nuclear techniques come in, that they can actually identify these kind of processes. But, um, yeah, I think it's very important to increase the yield, but at the same time not at the environmental cost of it. And I th think uh, the other question was basically to you as well from an African point, right? Um, very important. And thank you for the question. Okay. Um, I would wish to respond on the banana fusarium uh, disease and the cassava and say that the best way is to use resistant varieties um, so that you are able to develop varieties that will be resistant to the diseases as much as their soil, soil borne diseases. And um, this has already been attempted and uh, it's on course. So it's just to get your material so that uh, at the end of the day, you do not import material that has been developed that is not fitting in your environment. Because the uh, mutation techniques changes just one aspect or two at most. So you can have a very popular banana variety or cassava variety, and then you use nuclear techniques like irradiation so that uh, uh, we normally use gamma irradiation. You can also use x-ray so that you just change the aspect of uh, fusarium resistant, mm -hmm. resistance that is in the, in the banana or uh, mosaic or um, brown streak in the cassava. So uh, that would be the best way to use nuclear techniques in uh, managing the diseases. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Osi. I think if we look at uh, Africa and other low and middle income uh, countries, the, the major threat or the major contributor for livestock to, to climate change is really the, the extensive production systems and then the inefficiencies like the lo longer growth rates, the time that you know from an animal is born to, to slaughter and giving a product, and also then you know uh, poor utilization of the of the resources. So and and I agree with you considering that there will be more demand for livestock products. It's a major source of livelihood. You need to strike that balance, and and it's very difficult to convince the communities that we need to mitigate against climate change when probably food security is their major threat. And nuclear technologies and bi other biotechnologies are really allowing us to do that. One, if we have these indigenous breeds that are on extensive production system, one way you need to make sure is that they optimally produce. So being able to select them and to improve them for efficiency is one way of being able to mitigate against mm -hmm. climate change. But still at the same time ensuring that there is food at the table. 
uh, being able to use the local feeds. So it's not even importing other feeds from other sources. It's really saying the feed resources that are on the ground, can we characterize them to make sure that they don't uh, contribute to greenhouse gas emission, but also they contribute to optimal production. Animals are able to utilize them efficiently. So uh, for me, I think nuclear technologies are, are really allowing us to strike that balance because they are allowing us to improve efficiency. They're allowing us to tap into local resources that are found in those communities, which is at a lower cost. Thank you very much, Ms. Muchade. And that brings us to the end of this session. I just want to take a moment uh, to thank you again, uh, Professor Miller, for your presentation on how we can effectively mitigate climate change. Professor Chang, thank you uh, for teaching us some of the best management practices for climate change adaptation in agriculture. Thank you so much, Professor Liu, for sharing with us the success story of space crop breeding in China. Professor Kinua, thank you for those applications of mutation and enhancing technologies. And of course, uh, to you, Ms. Muchade, for the nuclear-related biotechnologies for improved and sustainable animal production. Welcome back, everybody. Thank you to those who were back here promptly before 2 p.m. We really appreciate that. Uh, and I know that uh, my fellow panelists up front here appreciate that too because they've spent a lot of time, they've invested a lot of time compressing uh, what are really depths of knowledge uh, into eight-minute presentations. Um, and they're going to do a good job delivering that. So I can already tell you I appreciate your timekeeping, uh, fellow panelists, uh, for the benefit of everybody. I'll just remind you that we're still in session one. This is the second panel now of session one. After session one, we'll move on to session two. So just to, to give you a bit of an orientation of how the day is going to go. But after this panel, uh, we will have a bit of a break uh, for coffee and to stretch our legs a little bit. So I know how it feels. You know, when we've had the lunch, we sort of the, the chairs are very comfortable in the room. But try because um, you really don't want to miss what they have. So make use of the water. Um, perhaps, you know, move around if you have to in your seat, uh, but you really want to be awake for every single one of these presentations, I promise. Uh, so resist the urge, ladies and gentlemen, uh, to perhaps take a bit of a doze. Now, we are still, of course, in uh, session one. This is our second panel, and we're continuing on the thread of innovations for enhancing plant, animal, and human health, as well as food safety. Now, we've had a look at the techniques and their potentials. That was during panel one. And in this next panel, really, what we want to do is have the experts examine for us how these technologies, this is the how factor, improve plant and animal, as well as human health, food safety, and human nutrition, and, of course, how this supports international trade. I'm going to now introduce our first speaker. I'm not going to do an introduction of all of them, but I'll introduce them as they come along. And our first speaker will be Ms. Zaitan Ahmad. She's Acting Director for the Division for Agrotechnology and Biosciences. This is at the Malaysian Nuclear Agency, of course, in Malaysia. Over to you. Thank you very much, uh, Madam Moderator. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, dear ladies and gentlemen, once again, my name is Zaitun Ahmad and I'm from Malaysian Nuclear Agency. And our agency is um, under the Ministry of Science, uh, Technology and Innovation, which is about, uh, we are situated in Bangi, Selangor, which is about 30 kilometers from uh, the capital city of uh, Malaysia, Kuala Lumpur. And uh, thank you very much, IEA and the IEA uh, Scientific uh, Forum for inviting me uh, to speak, uh, to give my insight uh, on the uh, crop uh, improvement approaches using nuclear and related technologies for uh, plant health advancement. Right, I move to the next slide. Okay, uh, I just talk briefly on uh, the world food scenario because it's very relevant to this uh, uh, our discussion this afternoon. So food security, um, uh, in 1996 uh, World Food Summit, uh, food security uh, was described as uh, when all people at all time have physical and economic access uh, to sufficient, safe, and nutritious food that meets uh, their dietary needs and food preferences for an active and healthy lifestyle. So the keywords here is at all time we must have safe and uh, sufficient uh, food uh, to feed everyone. So uh, I think everyone here knows that uh, our world population will be around uh, 10 billion in 2050. So with that number of population, the food demand will be increased. So I just 
uh, thinking this morning, um, if one people eat uh, half a kg of food every day, so we need around uh, 5 billion kilos of uh, food to feed the population, and, that, and that's a, a very a lot. Yeah? So we know that the impact of uh, climate change also on uh, the severity, uh, this is severity of plant uh, because of the imaging of new pathogen and then uh, increase in the pathogenicity of microbial strain that affect our crop uh, productivity, food supply, and finally, uh, our food security. That's why I think we are here today uh, to play, to play um, I mean, to play a little bit of our role uh, in improving our food security. Okay, next. Okay, uh, in th when we talk about crop uh, productivity, we know that uh, one of the, uh, among the major factors that contribute to lower crop production and uh, death of crops are pests and diseases. So, in, in fact, pests and diseases also decrease the quality, shelf life, and nutritional value of agriculture product. And it is estimated that 20 to 40 percent of crop loss due to pests and diseases. And worldwide uh, crop loss is estimated to be uh, 220 billion uh, USD annually. So I gave I gave here two uh, uh, main diseases for uh, uh, two crops huh? as an exam as example because I will use this crop uh, in my example later in my presentation. So for rice, um, the main diseases are blast, bacterial leaf blight, and bacterial uh, leaf strain, eh? can, which can um, cost between 30 to 50 percent of yield loss. Huh? And for banana, the main um, uh, diseases are fusarium, fusarium wilt, and moco. And the loss can be between uh, from 30 up to um, 100 percent. Uh, and in fact, uh, for fusarium uh, especially, uh, it can is now is considered as a pandemic in um, in Malaysia as well as in the Southeast Asia. So uh, one of the solution, it's not the only solution, but one of the solution is through uh, is using crop, impro uh, is, uh, crop improvement through uh, mutation breeding uh, technique to improve uh, disease resistance. And if you look at the IEA mutant variety database, you can see that uh, now is uh, approximately 3,433 uh, mutants that have been registered um, under this website, uh, and about 10% of them are uh, uh, pest and disease tolerant. So we can use, uh, uh, in, in terms of mutation, we can use either direct mutation, in direct or in vitro mutagenesis. Okay, uh, I won't talk in detail about this because the time is only uh, eight minutes, but the center of my presentation is the one in the middle, the box in, in, in the middle there, plant mutation breeding uh, for crop improvement, All right? Uh, so, okay, uh, to do uh, crop improvement using mutation breeding technique, we require uh, uh, suitable facilities. This facility, um, we call it uh, Gamma Greenhouse, is very close to my heart. Um, it's in uh, our agency. Um, it's a 15 meter radius, uh, it's a glass house. Uh, you can um, put your uh, potted plants uh, along the isodose line and you can uh, expose it to irradiation until your, the cumulative dose is achieved. Okay, for this one, uh, 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 it's for acute gamma irradiation. Uh, you can irradiate smaller sample like seeds, uh, cuttings of not more than uh, one foot, uh, bulbs and tissue culture. And on your right side is the ion beam facility in uh, Japan, National Institute for Quantum Science and Technology in Japan. And they said this uh, ion beam technology can produce higher mutation uh, uh, breeding highest uh, mutation frequency and uh, wider uh, mutation uh, spectrum. And we also have a chance to use this uh, facility. A anyone from JEA here? No? Uh, it's okay. Uh, I just want to say, Arigato gozaimasu. Okay. Um, so these are the specific example of uh, a rice mutant variety development for blast resistant. Uh, for anyone, uh, for those who are not familiar with the term, M1 is the uh, first generation. So we do um, a screening for blast uh, from M2 until the M4. We got the potential meter line that are resistant to blast, and then we move to local verification trial. And um, 
we managed to get. Uh, this project is under, by the way, is under IACRP, um, led by our former uh, DG before this, uh, Mr. Harun. So we managed to get uh, four uh, uh, selected lines, which are one is blast resistant, early maturity, as well as high yield. And now uh, we are working on uh, multi-location trial, um, uh, approximately 12 locations uh, throughout Malaysia. Okay, uh, here's an, another example. This one is uh, using in vitro metagesis technique uh, for banana. First, we have to establish the tissue culture material itself. Uh, and then we uh, move to irradiation treatment and then multiplication in vitro until fourth generation. And we do uh, a nursery-based screening in M1V5. And then we proceed uh, to uh, field screening at the hotspot area, uh, Fusarium hotspot area. Then we manage to get uh, 30 lines. Uh, before this, it was under IACRP. And now we move to IAA, TC, INT, 5158 for uh, the uh, field evaluation uh, in this one in, in collaboration with our Department of Agriculture. Right, this are uh, the example of the uh, success story on our uh, rice uh, mutant variety, uh, NMR152. It has the traits of high yield one and, and also tolerant to diseases like blast bacteria, BLB and also sheath blast. And um, currently uh, in 2022, it covered, covered approximately 27,600. Uh, and uh, a paddy field and already benefiting around 19,500 farmers in Peninsula Malaysia. And uh, farmers who use our uh, variety, they record up to 50% reduce in fertilizer input. And this variety has been officially la launched by our former Prime Minister in 2021. And it has already been certified as a national rice variety and also included in the uh, national rice seed subsidy program for uh, Malaysian farmers. You can see here the average yield for uh, before this using other variety and uh, using our variety, our variety they can get higher yield. All right. Okay. Um, Forty second to my time. It's okay. Um, Forty second over already. Yes. Sorry. Okay, I, I just uh, summarize uh, uh, in a very in and in, in very simple uh, vocabulary. Um, crop improvement uh, through nuclear technology has successfully generated many mutant varieties that are tolerant to pests and diseases, and produce uh, good yield uh, throughout the world. And uh, I think uh, the way forward is to expand the production. Uh, we need to share the germplasm and to uh, continue with commercialization of high yielding uh, disease uh, resistant mutant plants to improve uh, social and economic status of farmers around the world. And uh, in summary, nuclear technology in food and agriculture plays an important role in sustaining food security. With that, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Ahmed. And I maintained uh, the, the standard I set earlier to say the first speaker does get a little grace. Uh, so it's not to say that the others will be afforded the same opportunity to go over. I'll start intimidating you as I get closer to you. But we thank you so much, uh, Ms. Ahmed, for your presentation on the crop improvement approaches using, of course, nuclear and related technologies for plant health advancement addressing food, is food insecurity and malnutrition with nuclear science. Our next presentation is coming to us from Ms. Marie Yasmin Botain. She's professor at the University of Côte d'Azur in France. And um, her presentation, professor's presentation, is about ma my marine biotoxins and harmful algal bloom, enhancing seafood safety, trade, and human health with nuclear science. Thank you very much. And uh, before starting, I'd like to thank uh, the IEA Director General for the invitation to and the opportunity to be able to talk about this, what I consider a major issue, global issue. So phytoplankton in the marine ocean and in any aquatic uh, area are essential. They are really providing food to all marine organisms. They are producing uh, the, uh, oxygen. They are sequestering CO2. And there are many more uh, positive of course, aspect about phytoplankton. But in certain cases, they are harmful. Harmful by uh, the biomass that they can produce, which lead to uh, hypoxia, which can uh, then lead to mass mortalities of marine organisms. It can uh, lead also to, we talked this morning about drought issue. It can lead to the shutdown of a uh, desalination plant, for example. Uh, when the, the involved, toxin-producing species, 
They even contaminate the whole marine system, contaminating the seafood that we consume, reaching sometimes level above safety, which then lead to human intoxications. So harmful algal events, by definition, are the presence of noxious and toxic species, as well as this perception we have as human of being uh, noxious. So those, those uh, events, they are, uh, have drivers, natural drivers, but there's also anthropogenic drivers, such as nutrient input with the waste disposal, agricultural uh, uh, enrichment of the environment, Climate change is also key. We have been talking about that this morning. Water circulation changes. And the spread of harmful algal bloom also has been linked to water ballast. And now there are studies on spreading of those species through uh, plastic pollution. So the toxins are introduced to the marine food web through trophic transfer. So when the algae are, uh, I don't know how the pointer is working, maybe here, well, without. Uh, so the, the toxins produced by the algae are then transferred to the, to the trophic chain, and the exposure, the, the routes of exposure of humans might be done through the consumption of seafood that might be contaminated with those seafood, with those toxins. But there is also exposure through contact when swimming in seawater, as well as through inhalation, as those toxins might be aerosolized. The consequences are far-reaching with public health impact, environmental health impact with mass mortalities, marine organism uh, uh, death, uh, sociocultural behavior also that might be impacted with uh, those harmful algae, and of course, economical and livelihood consequences. To avoid contamination, the Codex Alimentarius has set some per uh, maximum level in seafood to protect um, the consumers. So this is from the FAO uh, last report on fisheries, and we can see how the consumption of seafood, how it is increasing, and also the associated trade over the, the time. So what can nuclear technique do to solve this problem? So there is one nuclear method that I will be talking, the radio ligand receptor binding assay, which is a functional based assay, based on the interaction of the toxin with their pharmacological receptor. And this technique can be applied to different group of biotoxins. Uh, and they provide an overall toxicity of a seafood sample. It's rapid, straightforward, high throughput, so easily transferable. And it involves, of course, like any uh, food contamination, preparation of sample, as well as the analysis. And there is an IEA technical uh, report on uh, describing this uh, methodology. So the method was developed for paratic shellfish poisoning toxins, and it has been validated back in 2011, and that was approved by the International Interstate Sanitation Shellfish uh, ISSC in the US, and adopted by the National Shellfish Sanitation Program, also in the US, so for, uh, as a method for muscle testing and as a limited method for clam and scallop. And more recently, there was a study uh, conducted for for applicability in the EU uh, and uh, was uh, proved uh, to be uh, ac acceptable for oysters. So there are some success stories. So the receptor binding assay is today used to uh, provide alert to aquaculture producers. So this is an example in Alaska, for example, where there is a platform where there is real-time reporting of the, the contamination of the, aqua of the coastline. And there is also possibility for the producers to provide sample for, to be analyzed for this uh, PSP toxin using this nuclear technique, the receptor binding assay. And receptor binding assay, another example, is also used to reopen aquaculture and then promoting trade by not only preventing intoxication, but allowing producers to again put on the market those seafood by reopening the, the, the market. The receptor binding assay was also developed for ciguatera uh, poisoning. So the, um, the ciguatera poisoning is a uh, known in tropical and subtropical regions, so well described, but it's also an emerging issue due to uh, climate change. So there is now uh, ciguatera poisoning in more temperate region. And for this toxin, on the other hand, there is no permissive limit yet or st international standard protocol that are established. So Codex Alimentarius is actually now working on uh, preparing a code of practice for ciguatera poisoning. But we have a nuclear technique that might be used uh, and potentially uh, be validated for uh, monitoring ciguatera 
toxins. So there is a single lab validation that has been conducted, but not yet any interlaboratory validations. So this method is described in the IEA technical document, but there is also an e-learning that produ produced jointly with IEA, Food and Agriculture Organization, the Attack Van Momental Oceanographic Commission. Uh, so the, the method is developed. There is material for technology transfer. Some countries have been also uh, trained to uh, uh, utilize these, uh, these techniques. Uh, and the technique is exactly the same. It's the same equipment as for neurotoxic shellfish poisoning, as, as well as the paralytic shellfish poisoning. So it's a very versatile methodology. So, but there are some challenges. So the primary challenge for this nuclear technique is really the access to the uh, sustainable and affordable not only reference material, but also radio ligands. So it's really the main challenge that we are encountering uh, today for a sustainable implementation of the receptor binding assay. Uh, there's also another challenge is the data acquisition and sharing for improved assessment and management. So it is important, of course, to establish regular monitoring and to develop database to be able to, to uh, better uh, predict and better understand how those harmful algae occur. Uh, important also to conduct interlaboratory uh, inter validation of the receptor binding assay, to perform ecotoxicological studies also to improve not only the analysis, but also the sampling to, before getting the, 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 those samples to, to analyze. And develop an integrated One Health project to link marine biodiversity conservation, harmful algal bloom, seafood safety, all that to be able to improve uh, human health and have better predictive uh, capabilities. So there's opportunities. So capacity building projects have been developed. So the technology are in place in the countries, but again, so, uh, equipment are not necessarily fully operational because of lack of some equipment. So the good news is that there is an, in, an IE interregional project, which we hope will lead to uh, respond and fill those gaps that are just lined out. Uh, and way forward is really to go through um, an early warning systems. By having on the left the now cast, it is monitoring, it's today's data. Compiling that also maybe with the knowledge of historical data as well as hydrographic data, oceanographic, atmospheric data. Combining, we can develop today, there is ways to develop models to be able to forecast those blooms and provide three to five times days lead time to the different stakeholders listed here. So the IEA together with the Food and Agriculture and Agri uh, and Organization and uh, IOC UNESCO have developed a manual to establish early warning system in the country and projects are starting now, so there's a lot of uh, good hope in that way. So in conclusion, I will, just, I will jump directly to the second one. So the receptor binding essay can play a crucial role in monitoring the different, uh, three different group of toxins and ensure food safety, promote nutritious food and reduce foodborne disease, but also support the trade by meeting those international um, regulatory requirements for, import, for importation. So there is an urgent need of validated method for ciguatera toxin and for more affordable reference material and radio ligand. And to finish, I would like to I insist on the fact that an integrated One Health research approach is needed. And we need to make sure that there is a strong commitment from the countries to ensure that no country is left behind. And uh, thank you, and I'm sorry for the extra time. I tried to speak fast. But, thank uh, you, <laughs> Professor Botain. Thank you. I appreciate that. Thank you. Our next presentation uh, is going to be brought to us by Professor Uliana Blitznyuk. She is Professor for the Research Institute of Nuclear Physics. This is in Lomonosov in Moscow State University in Russia. Uh, dear public, I am here to give an outline of the status of food radiation in Russia. Uh, re in response to the global problems faced by agricultural and health industries, such as intestinal infections, foodborne illnesses, and food spoilage, Russia is working towards the development uh, of industrial uh, approach to industrial food radiation. 
The complexity of logistics chains and diverse climate conditions poses a number of challenges. One of key challenges is to extend the shelf life of products by suppressing mold, bacterial, and fungal growth. Since Russia is a rapidly developing agricultural industry, another important focus is inhibiting uh, sprouting of root crops and pest control. Research areas in uh, research institutes in Russia are working in the following directions. Achieving a dose uniformity to ensure the efficient food radiation. Uh, determining the optimal dose range uh, for diverse product categories with different biochemical properties to suppress pathogens without a detrimental effect on uh, the quality of food products and crops. Uh, the development of software for estimating the radiation parameters for efficient radiation of food products and agricultural crops. Elaboration of methods for identification of irradiated food products. And other research areas are listed here on the slide. According to IAEA, Russia is occupied the first place as a user of electron beam accelerators at industrial irradiation facilities. The ability of electron beam accelerators to change operating mode allows to vary the penetration depth of electrons and achieve a high precision in treating both the surface layers of uh, root crops where the most phytopathogens can be found and the entire volume of animal products to fully suppress dangerous bacteria. And now I'm going to give an outline of few points of our research done in response to the demand of international community and Russian regulators to ensure food safety and security. Food safety is ensured by international standards, but it's important to keep food products tasty to make them attractive to customers. Irradiation suppresses dangerous microorganisms, but it also damages fats, proteins, and carbohydrates responsible for smell, color, and taste of the product. It's very important to establish fine criteria for determining the optimal dose range and set out an approach uh, to irradiation of diverse categories of food products. Uh, we've come up with a mathematical approach which uses optimization function, HD, shown here on this slide. Uh, this function allows to precisely estimate the optimal dose range, which suppresses pathogens to the required level while minimizing the negative side effect to the surrounding molecules. These two cases illustrate the optimal dose ranges for animal product, beef, and plant product, potato. We need to irradiate beef uh, with a higher dose range uh, because we have to kill a lot more microorganisms in meat than in potato, where they are found on the surface. Uh, once uh, the optimal dose range is established, we need to take care of the dose uniformity. Let's take chicken as an example. Chicken has both a complex geometry and tricky chemical composition since it has fats, bones, and other tissues. To be sure we kill all bacteria in every tissue, we have to keep the dose high, relatively high. But however, uh, the high radiation dose, which guarantees food safety, will inevitably worsen the smell and taste of chicken. To make the product both safe and tasty, we need to control the dose uniformity to make sure we uh, perform the irradiation within the determined dose range and the, our product is not overexposed. To achieve high dose uniformity, we use a combination of two solutions. Uh, before irradiating a product, we simulate an irradiation process using our certified software, which gives us precise optimal irradiation parameters for this product. Another way to achieve a high dose uniformity is to put the special aluminum modifier aluminum plates between the electron beam output and the product. OK, 
Okay, we have irradiated our food products in such a way that they are safe and tasty. But how do we know that other products out there do not pour the thread and are edible? And what if a product was uh, irradiated for the second time because it didn't have a special Radura symbol on it, which indicates that food item uh, has undergone irradiation? That's where food irradiation markers come in handy. Food irradiation markers are different compounds uh, which react to irradiation by changing in numbers. We found that some aldehydes, metmyoglobin, and potential damage to protein native structure can serve as reliable food radiation markers. Another way to uh, detect the irradiated food is to use our signature method called fluorimetric fingerprinting technique. Uh, which compares the fluorescence intensity and the rate of chemical reactions uh, involving carbocyanin dyes uh, in irradiated and non-irradiated food products. For example, fingerprinting technique allows to detect the irradiation of potatoes uh, by uh, the change in the rate of indicator reactions in the act occurring in the extracts obtained from irradiated and non-irradiated potato samples. Uh, food irradiation is a relatively new field of research in Russia with a vast potential. Further studies will cater uh, to the growing demand of food industries to extend the shelf life of convenience food and instant meals. Considering uh, the diverse, of, uh, uh, diverse uh, chemical properties and physical properties and geometry of marketed foods, it's necessary to come up with a sophisticated algorithm to industrial food radiation, consistent of two steps. Step one is to uh, determine the optimal dose range, which would take into account the individual uh, properties of the food product. Step two is to uh, determine the optimal radiation parameters, which would ensure that our product is radiated within the determined dose range. On top of that, uh, we will continue elaborating an express method for identification of irradiated food products uh, to uh, ensure food safety in various market conditions. Thank you for your attention. Thank you. Thank you very much for that, Professor Bliznuk. That was the status and the prospects of irradiation processing of agricultural products and fruit products in Russia. Our next presentation is coming to us from Ms. Maria Angelica Lorraine. She's Associate Professor at the Department of Food Science and Chemical Technology. This is in the faculty, faculty, faculty excuse me, of Chemical and Pharmaceutical Sciences at the University of Chile. Her presentation is going to be about enhancing food safety and quality uh, in Chile's experience. Thank you very much for giving me a space in this scientific forum to sh share the Chilean uh, experience applying nuclear and nuclear related technologies to enhance food quality and safety. I'm really happy to see uh, the remarkable scientific works applied to address food security challenges in a global climate change scenario. Thank you. Um, here, Chile is a narrow and long piece of land in South America facing the Pacific Ocean. Food production is the second most important activity in the Chilean economy after mining. Almost a third part of the companies in the country are in the food sector, generating 23% of jobs. And also 23% of the country's export correspond to the food sector. Uh, the main categories there. The main categories in value are fresh fruits and vegetables, salmons and wine, among others. However, to produce food in a more sustainable way and to be able to verify its authenticity and demanding uh, determining its origin with traceability based on scientific information has become a major challenge to ensure food safety and quality.
this slide presents the Chilean Agency for Food Safety and Quality, a Chibia organization. It is headed by an executive secretary who implements the decisions made by the council. This agency coordinates coordinates the national food safety and quality system with a systematic approach, considering its actions and actors, the public sector, food producers and processors, universities, trade associations, and consumers. Also, Achipia is supported by international cooperation through agreements, for example, with the IAEA. Uh, in the National Programmatic Framework 2020-2055 from the Chilean Commission of Nuclear Energy, CECHEN, and the IAEA, includes five thematic areas. Pest control using sterilized insect techniques, optimization of the use of agrochemicals in agroforestry production, capacity of plant species to adapt to climate change, traceability and authenticity food fraud and food origin, and food safety. These areas are being developed in, by four types of projects, capacity building, national projects, regional projects, and coordinated research projects, CRPs. In the next slides, I will mention the projects developed in Chile in these categories. Sorry. There. The, in the, um, starting with the capacity building projects, uh, the T21 executed by Achipia allowed to perform a diagnostic of the analytical capabilities for the determination of origin and verification of authenticity in food existing in the country at the moment. This diagnostic covered the private, the public, and the academic laboratories. This project also includes seminars and courses related to food fraud detection using nuclear and related technologies and the preparation of a roadmap to act, uh, address the issues at a national and international level. This roadmap also was prepared considering the public and private sector and academia. The other two capacity buildings project, sorry, no, these are the nationals, sorry for that. The um, other two capacity building projects are with the, um, were developed by the Agriculture and Live Talks Service, SAC. One uh, is the human and physical capacity were created with the National Animal Health Laboratory of the SAC and the gaps of biosecurity were identified to achieve a BSL3 laboratory. In the other one, the laboratory, laboratory gave support to small producers of organic agriculture products with training with also characterization of their products and associated practices using radio label standards in analysis with mass spectrometry and isotopic radio in oxygen and hydrogen. The, in the national projects, um, the first one participates with Achipia and was to intend to increase the value of food exports. Uh, specifically, the project collaborate for the implementation of the isotope ratio mass spectrometry at CETEN in the nuclear center in Santiago, Chile. This project was mainly focused in honey and benefits the Chilean beekeeper sector. Because nowadays, the 70% of honey produced in Chile is exported, but almost is sent to the European Union, but uh, shipped in bulk at lower value. And only uh, at the destination, the honey is certified for authenticity. We expect to do this certification in Chile, increasing the income that small beekeepers earn from their honey. 
The second national project is more focused in strengthening the 10 laboratories implemented in the previous one. And um, this uh, implements some uh, rapid techniques as infrared spectroscopy, portable X-ray fluorescence for origin determination, but it's just a starting. Yeah, the, uh, so the, the um, sorry, the, regarding the regional projects, we uh, can uh, mention three, the general analytical capacity in SAG for the analysis of persisted organic pollutants, validating the technique for breast milk and environmental samples. Also, the um, use of capacities using isotopic and conventional techniques to an agroecological and sustainable environment and will increase the efficiency of nitrogen use and reducing the contamination of water bodies with the nitrogen application. The other, uh, the next one is about the regional projects using um, nitrogen isotopic techniques for monitor the application of bacterial biostimulant in corn crops. This project has allowed Chile to establish the general basis for discussing the future standard and for biostimulant, uh, although Chile has no regulation about it. Uh, Mention a very brief the three co the coordinated research projects to developed by the Faculty of Veterinary Science. Uh, to they seek for generating scientific data on the depletion on various veterin veterinary drugs in different productive species and matrices use radio labeled drugs. Therefore, both methodologies developed within the framework of the project and the depletion data will be present in the respective codex committees. The final uh, CRPS uh, development is uh, about uh, the um, specifically in muscles. We are using data derived from DNA analysis and from isotopic radio measurement in individual from different locations and collected in different seasons in order to determine its species and geographical origin. And uh, finally, an ELIX uh, project that is led by Universidad de Chile and seeks to generate an interdisciplinary space for dialogue and collaboration on public issues in different topics. In the, face, in the case of food authenticity and fraud, it gathers public institutions. And uh, we, uh, the first derivable is a policy brief uh, that in two pages present the, the analysis recommendation and food, for food fraud authenticity. Uh, the main achievements, uh, I'll, uh, I'll mention it, were contribute to improve the national food safety and quality control system, food security and related to food authenticity, food origin capabilities, strengthening the national monitoring system for contaminants in food and the monitoring and responses capability of the SAC laboratory. The next Challenges refers to contribute to establish a regional informative system that includes a rapid alert system in the LATAM and the Caribbean. Yes, and the, there in the in the slide the, the main challenges so are uh, the the uh, the regional information system, the laboratory with analytical capabilities to ensure authenticity, and databases with DNA and isotopic information, and the analytical methodologies to propose to codex the, for the detection of beta-lactams in chicken's um, data. So um, this is it. Thank you very much, Associate Professor. 
I, I can only sympathize with our speakers. Uh, being locked into an eight-minute presentation isn't as simple, but I appreciate all the efforts that we're making um, up front here in terms of keeping the time. It's just to be fair to everybody else who has to present today and also to uh, our friends in, in the audience um, as well. So thank you so much for that. We'll move on now to our next presentation. That's going to be delivered to us uh, by Mr. Victor Ochieng Owino. He's a nutrition specialist at the International uh, Atomic Energy Agency. His presentation is about food systems and climate change. This is nuclear techniques to evaluate nutrition status and the nutritional value of foods and diets. Thank you very much and uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Victor Owino, as has been said, from the Nutritional and Health Related Environmental Studies section in the Division of Human Health. And I'm presenting this on behalf of our team from Botswana, led by Dr. Boy Tumelo Motswagole, who could not make it here today. So welcome with me. And as you see the topic, food only becomes useful once it is eaten and it goes into the human body and the nutrients are absorbed. So in this particular presentation, I want to use an example from Botswana to show you how a nuclear technique can be used to evaluate the interface between the human body and food and how food systems come into play to impact that. So welcome. So we heard about these numbers in the morning that due to the complex food systems, 2.8 billion people have not got access to healthy diets and 7 133 million are going hungry every day, and the projection is 582 million will become chronically malnourished as we go along. And in the past decade, the obesity pandemic has tripled over time. And we are most likely not going to meet the World Health Assembly targets for nutrition, for example, to reduce childhood wasting, to reduce stunting, to reduce anemia in children and mothers of re uh, women of reproductive age. Neither are we going to meet the target to reduce obesity and overweight. So, we cannot do things the way we've done them before. And one of the limitations is that we don't have adequate data to be able to address some of these issues. And let me not belabor that uh, driving factors that attend food systems like climate change impact food directly, for example, through reduced yield, reduced uh, nutrient absorption, but also through various means that impact directly onto the nutrition indicators that we are aiming to reduce. So what could be the value of nuclear techniques going forward? So uh, we could use uh, stable isotopes and related nuclear techniques to generate evidence on nutritional value of foods in terms of how much of the nutrients that are in the food are transferred from the food to translate into bodily functions. So we can measure the absorption of nutrients like iron, protein, zinc, and many others using various nuclear techniques. And we could also use the techniques to evaluate the impact of interventions like uh, the breeding that we've been talking about to see how they improve the nutritional value of food. And once we do that, we could go down and look at how this impacts nutritional status in specific ways. So uh, let me give you an example of iron deficiency, which is known to result in up to 4% reduction in per capita income, but also 
up to almost 1% reduction in uh, gross domestic product. And in Botswana uh, that I'm presenting the example from, four in 10 children below five years of age are anemic, three in 10 women of reproductive age are anemic. And this is driven not only by unhealthy diets, but also through infections. So, uh, since 1992, the Botswana government put in place a program to provide children below the age of three years with a specially uh, blended food that contains sorghum and soybean, and then through extrusion cooking, then they add a mix of vitamins and minerals. Then children are provided with this porridge. But over time, they still observed that anemia prevalence wasn't budging, so uh, going down. So through two national TC projects supported by uh, the IEA, uh, Botswana set out to understand what was going on. And first, from 2017, uh, they got support to variously look at the general nutritional status, but also the iron status among the children. And then since 2022, uh, they deployed a specific uh, nuclear technique to look at ion absorption from this very food that I've described uh, in the previous slide. So this technique uses two ion isotopes, ion 57 and ion 58, and you uh, prepare the meal, in this case the porridge from the flour that was prepared as I described, uh, and then you take a baseline blood sample uh, apply the ion isotopes in the food on two consecutive days. Then you wait for the ion isotopes to uh, enrich the bloodstream. And after 14 days, you can take a second uh, blood sample. And by looking at the appearance of these isotopes in the blood sample, you can tell how much ion was absorbed in the food. So in this case, about 18 children were uh, measured uh, as described here, and two forms of ion uh, fortificants that could be added to the food, ion fumarate and ion sulfate were compared and their absorption uh, measured in those foods. So as you can see here, uh, the ion fumarate had a relatively uh, high absorption, but the absorption was very comparable between the two compounds. So the implications is that we could identify the form of compounds of ion to add because it matters. Uh, the form of ion uh, determines absorption. But in the medium to long term, we could also recommend to test not just ion, but other nutrients in the food, in the whole diet, because food is never eaten as a nutrient. Food is a complex of many nutrients, for example, protein and other so because they also interact. And this project basically demonstrates how specific nuclear techniques could be used to address complex interactions between food systems and the human body and nutritional status. So I thank you very much, and I thank Dr. Boitumelo, who could not make it here. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Owino. Um, just checking on us, are we doing okay? Uh, we have two more speakers and then we can get to some uh, questions and answers. If you maybe are feeling a bit drowsy, perhaps we should stand and maybe stretch our arms a little bit for the benefit of those who might need it. Yeah, let's stand. It's okay. Let's stand, stretch the arms a little bit, maybe take a big sip of water. This will do us. Don't go out the room. Please don't leave the room. We're not doing that at all. We just, uh, this is just to stretch. Because, yeah, I mean, we've had lunch, so that's the other thing, right? So don't worry if you're feeling a little bit drowsy. It's just the food being digested as we go. Okay, let's sit and uh, let's get two more presentations. So 
if this goes the way it should be, it's basically 16 minutes and then we can ask some of our questions. So I hope you've been taking down your questions um, for the panelists up here because make sure to press them uh, while we have them all on stage with us. So please write down those questions and we will have enough time uh, to get to all of those. Our next speaker now um, is Ms. Maritza Juarez uh, Duran. She's the director of the National Fruit Fly Program. This is for the service of the National Health for Food Safety and Food Quality in Mexico. Her presentation is about the eradication of a Mediterranean fruit fly outbreak in Colima, Mexico. Thank you, good, good afternoon. Uh, thank you very much for this invitation. It is a pleasure for me to present uh, this um, topic, eradication of the Mediterranean fruit fly outbreak in Colima, Mexico. To begin with, uh, I would like to point at the Mexico is the seventh largest exporter of agriculture products in the world. The eradication of this pest is a food safety issue for Mexico. Why? Uh, the Mediterranean fruit fly uh, can be to affect about uh, 200 uh, species of fruit and flies. In Mexico, the Me Moscamet program uh, protects about uh, two million of hectares of different crops. Mexico uh, have um, Mexico has a national phytosanitary epidemiologic surveillance system to monitor into Mediterranean fruit fly and dirty other exotic uh, flies. Uh, in 2021, this system uh, detected this place, this pest in Colima, Mexico. It's, uh, it's, a, it's into uh, food safety. Um, after establishing the delimitation system, we have to detect this pest in 169 uh, square kilometers, affecting uh, fruits or tropical alm almond. Uh, it's not fruit of importance agriculture because this uh, pest re uh, represents a risk for uh, the agriculture of our uh, country. Um, we have to 24 hours to implement the plan, the contingency plan. This contingency plan uh, was divided into fast. The fear was surveillance, wind tramping for detecting uh, flies, and fruit sample for detecting worm. Uh, after this activity, we using different, uh, different uh, measures for delay this pest. The fear was destructive uh, fruit, uh, other activities are ground spray. In this case, the pest was detected in urban area. It's not possible uh, spray area, only uh, 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 to uh, terrestre, <laughs> um, but it's important uh, to comment that the two activity was case to the eradication this plus. The first was the use it the sterile insect technique. Another was the biological control. I will about uh, the um, sterile insect technique. Uh, Mexico have uh, 
any facility, one facility uh, where uh, we uh, produce and sterilize uh, many flies. Uh, we capacity is about uh, one million for week. It's big, the, the facility. Uh, we use the uh, gamma rays uh, in this uh, activity. After, uh, one moment. <laughs> I am a few uh, nervous. Okay. Okay, okay, okay. Uh, we have uh, one facility to produce, and we have one painting. A packing center where the flies emerge uh, after we release by light aircraft in different uh, in different areas when the pass the pest was detected. We have used nuclear energy since 1979 for the production of a sterile insect technique, which uh, has helped or remain a pet fry country. As a result of the action, we can uh, be seen in this graphic. Uh, the first stage was the limitation and control. The second stage was suppression and containment. And finish we uh, apply a replication state. Was dirty nigh weeds without best record. It's important uh, comment uh, this work, uh, in this work, uh, uh, help different uh, actors, for example, scientists, uh, technicals and authorities involved, uh, involved in this subject. I can to comment that the International Atomic Energy Agency and a one group of Mexican techniques and the support of many instances of the country to implement can carry out the communication action. Finish in 2022, uh, our, uh, our Secretary of Agriculture was notified of eradication. Uh, what, is what is important the sterile insect technique? Because it's specific environment friendly, it does not present a risk of development resistance of occur with the chemical control. Uh, and the national and international market of fruit flight and vegetable remain an open of the benefits of producer, parker, and exporter. Finish. I commend a nuclear technology, the sterile insect technique applied together with surveillance and other control methods, provide once again to be an effective tool for eradication and quarantine pine. Prevention of pest incursions and rapid respite to outbreak can be or can protect the agriculture industry of countries and greatly contribute to food security and food safety. Thank you. Thank you very much for that. Thank you so much uh, for that. We appreciate that. And that is um, our second last presentation uh, for this. Thank you. Thank you very much for that. Um, and that is going to be brought to us by Mr. Modibo Traure. He's a senior consultant at the Manager Bureau. Uh, day to day, 
Dear Consul in Mali. His presentation is about strengthening the FAO and IAEA partnership. This is from complementary to synergy, aligning the stakeholders for greater impact for nuclear applications in advancing global food security and climate resilient agriculture in Africa. Thank you very much, Madam Moderator. Uh, as you see, this uh, presentation is about, in particular, strengthening partnership in animal health. It is not about all the activities, but uh, precisely about animal health. Animal health, why? Because it is a very important issue in our region, in Africa. Africa is currently the single region in the world where episodic transboundary animal diseases represent the major factor of loss uh, productivity, loss of uh, animals, and so on. So that's why I think if you are able to control uh, animal health issues, you can improve considerably uh, the food security issues. The new challenges that have come recently are listed here about uh, the statistics. I think you have heard this morning all the statistics and even in this afternoon. Uh, there are really serious problems that have deteriorated uh, the food security situation. And the uh, new pathogens also are emerging or re-emerging. The climate change is an issue and the low productivity of agriculture as a whole, agriculture meaning livestock, cereal uh, culture, and uh, aquaculture, I think this is also uh, due to the high pressure on the natural resources. There are opportunities, and, but, and constraints. We think that the development of innovative and contextually relevant technologies can be useful. And uh, what we want to see is that with uh, this uh, SDGs issue, the uh, UN Agenda for Sustainable Development, to have now an initiative like uh, Atom for Food is really welcome because this is an opportunity for the community, the international community, not only to renew the partnership between FAO and IAEA, to try, try to catch up with what has not worked very well, but also to expand this partnership to other stakeholders uh, operating in the same field. Because we know that uh, FAO and IAEA are not the, uh, the only players in animal health in Africa. Here in this uh, uh, slide, you see global players. I have listed Wahoo, uh, the former OIE, uh, FAO, of course, and IAEA. But you have also at regional level, you have the African Union offices that are really doing a lot of job, PANVAC and AUIBAR. I want to salute the director of AUIBAR here. And you have, in addition, these regional animal health centers put in place by the regional economic communities in the different regions of Africa. At the country level, of course, you have the national veterinary services, you have the private sector, you have NGOs, and so on and so on. Just to give an example of what we can do with this uh, nuclear-related nuclear technology in the livestock sector. The ELISA, I think you know all what it is about, is a nuclear-related technique for diagnosis and control of transboundary animal diseases. It has been really helpful in an operation, a campaign, to eradicate rinderpest. Rinderpest also, I think there is no need to present it, this is one of the uh, 
most <laughs> deadly disease in animal, in animal health. For centuries, it has been the main causes of famine, of disasters in all the regions, not only in Africa, but in other regions like uh, uh, North America and uh, Europe, they were able to uh, get rid of it because of the sanitary measures. At that time, it was possible to use that because it is the measure of stamping out. You have to kill everything uh, that has been contaminated or that has been in contact with the animals. So, in the last decades, we had the reemergence of this disease up to the 60s. So it was a very, very, very big scourge for Africans. And what happened is that there was a political will and uh, the global players, you remember them, FAO, IAEA, and WAHU, they came together with the countries and the regional organizations. They put, they set up a group called the GREP, the group uh, for the Rinder Pest Eradication Program. This group had a strategy. In uh, three words, the strategy was about mass vaccination, second, surveillance and control, and uh, last thing, it was about the zero surveillance to make sure that the disease has been completely eradicated. The first thing, the mass vaccination. The target was to be able to vaccinate at least 80% of the total cattle. And this was not very easy to, to control because the techniques in a, a laboratory were not really uh, adapted and appropriate. This is where ELISA came in. With ELISA, it was very cheap. It was very simple to use, but it needed to be adapted. And this is where IAEA, in particular the lab in Seisbergdorf, uh, brought really insight and uh, uh, knowledge uh, to make sure that we can use in a credible way this technique to, to, to go ahead. Oh la la, I have no time. So I will go. <laughs> uh, but as a result, in 2010, 2010, we were able to eradicate completely from the surface of the planet. There are some other success stories. I don't want to go into details. You see them. And uh, as Madame, uh, the last speaker said, we had also uh, the, the use of this SIT to combat uh, disease-borne vectors. So it has been really very helpful. That's why it is very important. If we have the technology, we need now to come together and to build a partnership, to build synergies. You will tell me that we have already partnership between FAO and IAEA. It is not enough. It is not because this is not, a, it is not a problem between them, but it is about the way we are organizing this partnership. The partnership should be at the three levels. You see the CRP level, you see the TCP levels, and also the lab level. We need to bring on board new partners and to see how we can improve, how we can adjust the way they were working together. The opportunities are everywhere in the CRP. Just an example, you know, CRPs, we know that uh, <clears throat> these are the, where the de uh, they develop the technologies <laughs> for uh, using, for adapting uh, nuclear technologies. But we think that this should be inspired by the strategic planning objectives of FAO, FAO as a leading organization in the field of agriculture. So it is important to have this in mind. The TCPs, 
the TCPs also, we need to see how we can bring on board new players to improve the monitoring of uh, uh, field projects and to make sure that there is a synergy between the projects implemented by uh, IAEA and the projects implemented to improve productivity in other places. And finally, the VET lab network, of course, is very important. But if you know that uh, these uh, different uh, players have got different uh, networks, FAO has got its uh, network of reference laboratories, OIE has got its own network, IAEA has got its uh, own network, we think that if we are able to bring them together, this will be uh, really something uh, useful because uh, <clears throat> uh, it is not about operating alone. It is about putting together our strengths and to make sure that we are able really to fight these uh, diseases. The last word I want to say is that we know how to combat these transboundary animal diseases. We know how to eradicate some of them. Not every disease can be eradicated, but we know that there are diseases that can be eradicated. Among them, this FMP is well known. The PPR, the pest the petit ruminant, is also very well known. But since 2010, we are talking about using the same model of fighting diseases to eradicate these diseases, but up to now, no meaningful initiative has been taken. I think that is one of the reasons we should get, come together for new partnership and also to renew the political will to fight AC, AC diseases. Thank you. Thank you very much. And now I'd like to open it to the audience for any questions. Just please show by raise of hand if we have any questions in the house. I know in the first panel, they all, the hand started coming in a little bit later. It just took one person to do it, a little bit of an icebreaker. Um, but perhaps while I'm up here with the panelists, um, Professor Bisnuk, I had a question for you uh, from your presentation in Russia. Could you tell us about the food products that need to be irradiated in Russia? Uh, now in Russia, uh, irradiation facilities are irradiating uh, meat, fish, berries, nutritional supplements, mm -hmm. uh, and spices. Uh, I think we will ex extend this area and we will irradiate the convenience food and instant meals because we see the growing demand of the food industry to extend the shelf life of these categories of food products. Thank you very much. And to you, Ms. Duran. I wanted to know about what was the, you were taking us through the, the eradication of the fruit fly in, in Colima. What was the, the biggest challenge in that effort? The exit to Colima was the participate of different uh, uh, actors mm -hmm. and they used the sterile insect technique was K for the eradication. Uh, if no eradication on these pets in my country, the food uh, was, uh, the food is a big risk. The food. Professor Botheim, um, if you could maybe tell us a little bit more about the potential health effects that are associated with consuming seafood that's contaminated um, by biotoxins and how severe and dangerous these effects can be. Yes, uh, so uh, the um, different illnesses that uh, are induced by consumption of seafood that are contaminated with uh, algal biotoxins are very diverse. We have very diverse health consequences. They can go from uh, very uh, simple stomach ache all the way to neurologic symptoms. So the 
the fact that some of them have a very yes, uh, similar symptoms as uh, we would have when the food is not properly uh, preserved makes that uh, f uh, the harmful algae uh, intoxication are underreported. Uh, and also the, the specific effect of the toxin uh, such as uh, neurologic cell shellfish poisoning, ciguatera, where we have a uh, neurological effect, some physician might not be aware of those uh, of those symptoms and one and uh, some toxins are also deadly so the pyritic shellfish poisoning above certain level may lead to the death of the consumers and i would like to, to also add that it's not just a food safety issue it's also a drinking water issue uh, when harmful algae occur in freshwater area where desalination plant cannot function correctly and there is also questioning of potential contamination by biotoxin in drinking water. So very far-reaching effect of uh, the, those algal uh, biotoxins. Thank you. Mr. Owen, I have a, a follow-up question for you as well, but I just want to ascertain if there are maybe any questions in the audience. Okay, it's a bit, okay. I see a gentleman in the back, and then I see another gentleman. If, I, if you wouldn't mind, so one and two. And three, okay, I thought I could get away with it, Mr. Wiener, but I think I must prioritize uh, the floor. So yes, please, sir. Uh, thank you for the opportunity. Uh, mine, I just have two uh, questions. The first is uh, on the experience on uh, eradication of uh, uh, the fruit flies. Is, you, you're talking of, uh, uh, if I get it correctly, uh, just uh, you sterilize them to make them not productive. And if that's the case, uh, don't you think that it will be a threat to the biodiversity loss? Because if they cannot produce, uh, which means, of course, you're going to eradicate uh, 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 those flies. Is it not uh, uh, an impact to the biodiversity loss, which of course probably it may have some other consequences? That's the first. But the second question is, uh, we've been talking this morning uh, on the advantage of uh, 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 radiation technology when it comes to food security. But is there any uh, also uh, sort of negative uh, impact associated with that so that, of course, uh, uh, we can also be aware of uh, what you want really to engage into, into, into the use of this technology? Thank you very much. Your second question, was that directed to a specific panelist? I, I think the second question is general because uh, they all are advocating for the use of this technology. So is there any really negative impact associated with Okay, got it, sir. And I think we were somewhere in the middle here for our second question. Okay, thank you very much. And my question is um, directed to the person who was presenting on the food formulation from Botswana you are using two iron isotopes. So I want clarity on the food commodities or the types of genotypes that were used because in order for you to inform the policymakers, you need to know what were the initial or the type of genotypes that were used for sorghum and also for the soya bean. Because sometimes, you know, you can do the formulation not knowing the initial commodities that we're using. Thank you. Thank you very much. And then we had one more question. Uh, food oh, please go to, okay, towards yeah. the... Yeah, food irradiation food has very uh, wide spectrum of applications. Uh, and now... Uh, there are issue of chemical fumigants. Uh, uh, so uh, I know uh, what is the extent and how best uh, and how quickly we can adopt this technology globally, so that we can preserve, preserve uh, huge quantum of losses happening in the food. Besides uh, getting rid, uh, rid of the chemical fumigants, so that is the com comment from the panel. I expect. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, okay. I think let's start with. Um the questions about the fruit fly, did you get the question? Um, whether or not that is potentially a threat to the biodiversity, the, the sterilizing of the flies? Yes, that was for you. Yeah. You need the question again? Can you uh, translate in Spanish? Ah, okay. it, uh, Roy? Is it? Can I translate? Yes, please. Yes. Yeah, uh, he was asking if, uh, sorry. Te pregunto si cuando irradias los insectos, si hay un peligro para 
para la, las especies que están ahí autóctonas, si es una, un peligro para la biodiversidad. Okay. Lo que le debe responder es que como es una invasive species, pues eliminarla es lo mejor. Ok, es un riesgo porque la esteroid es específica para la más que produce our insect only one uh, we insect is uh, well, our facility has protection for only sterilize our insect only mediterranean fruit fly not other species is correct yes yes and in addition to that small thing I want to add just uh, one perspective. Uh, you know, we have uh, been using also this SIT for uh, uh, combating uh, trypanosomiasis, tr uh, African animal trypanosomiasis. And it is very important to understand that biodiversity, we are uh, uh, talking about biodiversity for useful insects, for insects that are really uh, assisting in this uh, Uh, polliniza pollinization or for some other things. But there are, in the nature, you have some insects that are really not helpful. Uh, the sissy flies are one of them. Uh, we have been working with the animal trypanosomiasis, but they transmit also, they are vectors also for human uh, sleeping sickness, which is incurable. When you, you see how many people have died from that, you can understand that it matters really to fight these uh, vectors. Thank you. Thank you. I know the gentleman had a second question um, that was directed to all of you. If somebody wants to pick that one up. Do we remember the question? Do you think you've dealt? Yeah, you can remember. Oh, you need me to remind you. I myself am not clear on the question myself, so if you wouldn't mind just, just saying it very briefly for us. Yeah, maybe I should just repeat. I just want to know, uh, we've talking about the positive side of these technologies, but what are the negative sides? The negative sides to the technologies, is very general. Yeah, I, I, I'm talking about uh, uh, animal health issue. The technology used is ELISA. This is a lab te technique uh, which Uh, is just uh, to, to know, to measure, to quantify how many antibodies or how many antigens are in a sera, a particular uh, 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 sa sample. Mm -hmm. But for this kind of uh, technology, you cannot uh, say that uh, there are uh, uh, advert uh, or uh, things that can be really, uh, uh, how to say, non sweat up. Uh, not uh, we, 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 I don't see anything uh, bad uh, in this kind of technology because it is not about uh, creating something new, but it is about improving the tools we are using just uh, to, to improve our knowledge. Mm -hmm. To know, if you know via this uh, technology that the animal has come to a contact with the antigen, Sometimes you don't have the symptoms. There is no symptoms. But you are able to say that, aha, the virus is circulating in this particular area, and we have to take measures. Mm -hmm. And I told you that uh, uh, this is very important. And after mass vaccination, the mass vaccination of animals were, uh, has taken three years. And after that, every time you see some uh, uh, symptoms or you see something which is not uh, uh, very clear, You have to do this uh, test to make sure that it is not about rinderpest. Mm -hmm. If it is rinderpest, you come again with a targeted uh, vaccination to make sure that the animals have been uh, protected in the area. I think we should be positive uh, regarding these uh, technologies. Uh, we don't know uh, uh, everything about them, but what we know is that they are helpful. And let us try uh, to take what we can to improve the food security situation with the, this side of uh, mm -hmm. technology. Thank you, Mr. Traore. Mr. Owino, there was a question for you as well, specifically, but perhaps yes. 
Prof, you can maybe take that now and then I'll come back to Mr. Yes. Owino. Uh, sorry, I, I would also uh, like to add that um, I agree that every, every technology has a positive and also negative uh, impact. But in this case, I guess that the, the negative impacts that I uh, can visualize are very, um, very few, the residues, for example, um, in, in relation with the positive impact that the use of the technology that is presented here uh, can offer. So um, this is my opinion. Thank you. So thank you for your question. I agree that the variety and the genotype is very important as it would determine the nutritional profile but also the palatability and eventual acceptability of the food that comes from these ingredients as to the specific genotypes that were used to formulate uh, this particular product in Botswana, I would have to ask my counterparts. And if I get your contacts, I could share the information later. Thank you very much. So if you wouldn't mind me asking you to please just repeat your, your question again, and perhaps if you would like to direct it to a specific panelist, otherwise uh, they can pick up. No, I just repeat my question. Yes. Uh, we all agree that uh, radiation processing of food has very broad spectrum and wider applications. We all agree to it. And uh, loss of food is also very significant, that also we agree. Then what is the approach to deploy this technology in the larger scale and the bigger way? So wh what should be our uh, take home message to deploy the technology in the very bigger way so that we can address the issue of food security uh, uh, worldwide? Yeah, yeah. Thank yeah. you very much, sir. Panelists? If anyone would like to take that up. Oh, there's one here for us. Yeah, I think if I understand you, uh, you are talking about we have an existing uh, technology, a package that can be helpful, that can solve the issue of food insecurity all over the world, everywhere. This is not uh, uh, specific to uh, nuclear technologies, nuclear related technologies. You know, I told you in my presentation that the model that was used to eradicate, eradicate, this was the first disease eradicated uh, in uh, animal health f f since the, the planet does exist. So we know how to do, we know how to cooperate, but we need the necessary leadership to take this initiative to organize people and to come up with a program to fight some of the diseases which are really very relevant currently. The pest de petit ruminant PPR is everywhere in all the continent. Maybe even in uh, Europe, I think I heard that uh, in Southern Europe they have some cases. So I think it is important for us to understand that a technology is just a technology. If you want it to be operational, so you have to bring together the, a strong leadership to bring together the political will among the decision makers and to bring on board also people that are ready to finance. Some of the issues are about financing. In the case of Rinder Pest Eradication, we had uh, several uh, donors, we had government, national governments. Uh, in uh, uh, park countries, in uh, Warek and Sarek countries, in Asia, South, South Asia, and uh, 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 Southern Asia. But we had also the leadership of European Union who brought most of the resources that was necessary to develop things and to make sure that people can uh, get in the labs the equipment they, 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 they need, et cetera, et cetera. I think the question you are asking is a very, very broad question. And we have so many things, bad things on our planet that could be stopped today. But why are not, we are not able to do that? I have, I'm sure that everyone has an example in his mind that 
we need this leadership, we need this partnership, and we need people to be convinced that this is not our interest. It is not because I am suffering of it, and she is suffering from that, that she will say, oh, this is his business. I think this it shouldn't be like that in our planet. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. I'm looking about for any more questions from the floor. Panelists, anybody wants to respond at follow-ups to anything that has been asked? I'll give everybody just a moment to perhaps think if they've got some questions. I was presented some that were collected um, earlier as well. And I can pick up on those while we're having a think in the audience here. There was another one uh, for you, Professor Botain, and this was how changes, or excuse me, how international partnerships and sharing data help tackle the global problems of harmful algal blooms. So that's one on international partnerships and sharing data. Yes, I mean, we uh, start, I try to uh, uh, address a little this question about the need of data that is essential. So developing early warning system for harmful algal bloom really uh, require to have uh, data accessible. And it's uh, also um, harmful algal bloom, they do not have any border. So it is important to work at regional level that makes sense on, on the ocean scales. Uh, working together will help to um, communicate when there is a bloom, there is a way to know where the bloom is going to migrate and maybe provide an uh, alert bordering country on the arrival of, uh, of a bloom. So sharing of data also helps to better understand the trends of harmful algal bloom, to know what is the status, has there been any uh, increase associated with uh, uh, climate change, for example. And often, I mean, we, the uh, Intergovernmental Oceanographic Con Commission has conducted a global hype status report in, in a partnership also with the IAEA. And uh, so there was conclusion on the, I mean, we could really link harmful algal bloom with, uh, for example, the event associated with harmful algal bloom with the increase of uh, consumption, of production of seafood, the increase of monitoring. So we do are much more aware of what's happening. But those data, if they are not shared, we cannot really understand the phenomenon. And the more we understand, the more we can provide solutions. So there are tools to be able to detect toxins in, the, in, uh, in seafood. So we can, yes, avoid having contaminated seafood reaching the plate. But the more we will know in terms of, uh, histor uh, of history, how to link that to specific uh, environmental uh, parameters, oceanographic temperature, wind, etc., the more data we will have that are publicly available, the better we will be able to develop models and better uh, protect trade, seafood trade, as well as uh, human health. So yes, partnership, data sharing, it's really something that is uh, essential uh, to progress uh, and uh, yes, have a, even better solutions. Okay, um, Associate Professor Lorraine, uh, one for you here is, um, in your experience in Chile in uh, establishing a food safety agency that other countries, what could other countries learn and how could the Atom for Food initiative uh, make a contribution? Mm. Mm. In, in Chile, our major uh, challenges are related to, to build our own um, uh, food fraud and food authenticity um, uh, regulation, because uh, of now um, we we don't have the one position. The public services has a, 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 a partial um, orientation, and uh, we are gathering uh, these positions together in Proyecto Elise. So um, we expect to 
to build one um, one way, one policy to to uh, abort these uh, challenges um, effectively. So this is the the main the main topic uh, nowadays uh, in the related to to food fraud and authenticity. Um, uh, issues in the country. Uh, I don't know if uh, I, I, I think that our countries more advanced in this uh, in these matters, but also uh, other ones that uh, are like us or or even uh, doesn't give these first uh, steps. So. I think that the first step could be um, gathering positions uh, among the, all the actors in the country that has related with the topic. Thank you. Um, Ms. Ahmed, one for you here is that um, some regions or, or countries specifically are still skeptical on products that are developed from nuclear technology. and. How would you convince the public to accept these products or this technology? You sort of alluded to it in your presentation, but if you could. Thank you very much. Um, yeah, um, after more than 50 years uh, since the first mutant, uh, people are still uh, skeptical about the mutant seeds or the mutant plant. But uh, yes, I think um, IEA and all the uh, participating members, I think we are working hard to uh, give awareness and uh, to to everyone uh, so that uh, they can uh, be, because they see the benefit first mm -hmm. uh, because uh, when they uh, some people say seeing is believing so if you can see the benefit of the yeah. mutant seeds then they will believe you in fact um, uh, in uh, Malaysia uh, uh, sometimes if we go for promotion and exhibition, uh, in fact, uh, people are more afraid of GMO <laughs> as compared to the uh, mutant mm. seeds because they always ask us, is it GMO? Is it GMO? I'm not talking about GMO is bad now. But um, they, they are more afraid of GMO <laughs> compared to the mutant seed. But um, we are lucky also because uh, we have uh, Biosafety Act, Malaysian uh, Biosafety Act, and um, mutagenesis is specifically exempted from the that biosafety act so that give a like a confidence to the public to use the mutant seeds so that's thank you us. thank you very much for that and this is where we'll leave it uh for this second uh panel in session one thank you so much to all the speakers up front here for your contributions. Thank you also for taking part in this conversation. And because I've taken into our coffee break, I'll release us all now to have us be back here in 12 minutes so we can get uh, session two underway at 4 p.m. on the dot. Thank you, everybody. And thank you again to the speakers.